This is Bazaar Morning Call. Broadcasting live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios in Mumbai. Good morning. Welcome to Bazaar Morning Call. I'm Sonia Shanoya joining us live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studio. It is the start of a brand new year. Happy New Year to all our viewers. I mean, of course, yesterday was the first day of the year. So whoever's back after the holidays, I wish you a very, very happy 2024 and hope you have a great year similar to what we saw last time around. Today I have with me Nigel and Surbi. Folks, happy New Year to both of you. This one's going to be a great one. Happy New Year and welcome back, Sonia. <laughs> I know. We had a fair amount of action and drama yesterday itself yes. playing out because the market's been anything but quiet, I can tell you that. The usual last uh, end of the year scenario that plays out, that's not been the case because we've had FII money coming in, markets making fresh highs. Mm. Uh, and yesterday we had an intraday fresh high, then there was a bit of a shakeout. Uh, but I can say it's been anything but quiet actually in these last couple of days of 23 and the first day of 24. Absolutely. And you know, I was uh, in Dubai for New Year's mm -hmm. and there's so much talk about India now, not just mm -hmm. in the Indian equity markets, but in the Indian real estate market as well. And I think this chatter has picked up significantly over the last uh, six, seven months. I was trying to find out the reasons for that and people were telling me that people in India have, all over the world actually, have made so much money in the Indian markets mm. that now they want to sort of, you know, move out or expand. People are moving from India to Dubai as well. So lots happening. I mean, India seems to be the focal point of, of everyone's yeah. discussion. You know, Sonia, it's get, that's what makes it a little tricky, right? Because yeah. at the start of 2023, you were saying, we'll enjoy some bit of a party, it's fine. At the start of 2024, <laughs> you want to party. You're yeah. saying that 2024 belongs to India. India should do well, which makes it a little bit tricky. But uh, in a longer term, I think in the next few years, you know, it's, it belongs to India, I think. Uh, I put out this piece yesterday, uh, yesterday as well on social media that we talked about India, you know, earlier we talked about plus one and that's why India gains. India is moving to the only one maybe. Only one, so let's yeah. see how, how that works Expectations out. are high now. True. So perhaps that also leads to disappointment. But anyway, we have lots to talk about this morning. So let's get straight to that. The market momentum continues to be quite strong. There's no two ways about that. Um, 2024 has begun with a considerable amount of outperformance from the mid-cap end of trade. So I don't know whether that will be the trend, but at least that's something we've noticed in the last couple of days of this market. Uh, there's a big rally that we've seen in uh, the chemical names, in metal stocks. There are some upgrades that have come in on metal stocks this morning as well. So that will be the key focus area for me. Remember, dollar and bond deals continue to fall, so keep an eye out on that piece. Apart from that, the next trigger, of course, will be the technology earnings. You have both Infosys and TCS coming out on the same day. So uh, keep an eye out on those stocks. January 11th is when uh, these numbers come out. So that will be the next trend setter for the market. And, you know, we have some strong operational data that's come in from the likes of Coal India, etc. Nigel will talk about that in a bit. But apart from that, the overarching theme is that this market has done a lot of work in the last one month. In fact, the Nifty is now up 1,000 points in the last one month. And seems like that momentum could continue. The Dow put in almost 14% in 2023. The Nasdaq put in 44% in 2023. And now perhaps they could build on to those gains as they kickstart trade later this evening. Uh, yesterday, there was a the tsunami warning because of which you saw that intraday dip. Uh, but I reckon that could be used as a buying opportunity in the market because, you know, um, that's been the case so far. This morning, the Gift Nifty is suggesting a very, very flat start, perhaps consolidating around this 21,500 mark. But I think every uh, dip will be used as a buying opportunity, as has been the case uh, for the last many months. No, absolutely. And I think that's what we, you know, uh, we need to see, yeah. whether the dips keep getting bought or not, because that's been the texture and the nature of this market, right? Uh, I just want to say that uh, for me, this volatility that's been rising, so I went back and just checked the wicks out over the last couple of weeks. And it's interesting because as the market has been riding higher, so has the VIX, which is usually a sign that people, you know, uh, take on board with some caution. Uh, rising VIX usually gets people a little nervous. So in November, we were at about uh, 11 thereabouts on the volatility index. That number moved up to all the way to 15, we're around about that, that level even now, 14 and a half thereabouts. So uh, volatility perhaps has become a bit of a reality as we are dealing with elevated levels. So that kind of is par for the course. And therefore, we need to be a little mindful of the mini shakeouts. Look at what happened yesterday. The market hits an intraday high of uh, uh, 21,834 to be precise. Within 60 seconds, there's a turnaround and a very, very sharp one at that. And we had a complete reversal come through. So yeah, that's the, good we brought up the intraday graph. That's the picture. So we need to sort of uh, keep the guard up, I guess. That's something to, uh, to take home. In terms of, uh, you know, more numbers and cues, 
The FIR number yesterday turned negative for the first time in four or five sessions. I mean, that's what I was saying. The last week of December was, uh, you know, anything uh, uh, but one to forget because we were getting 3,000 crores, 4,000 crores of money every single day. Yesterday was the first negative day because we were discussing this earlier that the year-end phenomena could have been that NAV adjustment, particularly on the index fund side. So maybe some, you know, adjustment of positions taking place. Most of the global markets are resuming work, coming back. So we'll have more clarity on the FI numbers and the whether the, the flows can continue. This huge number of 66,000 crores of December, whether we will see more of the same or not in January, that's something to watch. Uh, the, by the way, in terms of macro data points, as markets come back to work, uh, we've got the manufacturing numbers from China. China's picture continues to be as bleak because the official PMI number that's come in manufacturing PMI, it's showing more contraction. 49 is the figure, three straight months of contraction, and it's uh, worse off than November. Anyway, usually China's uh, pain has been India's gain, so we see if that plays out to, to our advantage or not. Finally, sector rotation has been very evident in this market, and we saw more of that yesterday as the market positions for the next event, which is earnings, IT, there was some buying in IT coming in. Autos, there was a sell on news play out. Anyway, the December numbers weren't anything great to write home about, mostly missing expectations for most of the manufacturers. So money rotating out of auto going into IT. But, you know, for me, folks, it's all about the banks, and we've been discussing that with all our guests. That's the big, you know, uh, trade of 2024 that's supposed to take off. The thing is, we have, like, it's... And two steps forward, one back. That's been the story with the banks. Uh, so whether we can get consistent outperformance on that big index, the Nifty Bank, I think that's going to be one of the big points that I watch out for today and the rest of this week. You know, I was off uh, towards the end of the last year and uh, people say that the FIs went on the break. But you know, periodically, I was just checking what are the FI flows. <laughs> it appears they didn't go on the vacation. They, I <laughs> didn't feel like a vacation at the all. The kind of money that was coming in. But, yeah. you know, I think to get a better trend in terms of what the FIs are doing, we'll have to wait for around two to three trading sessions. Or, and then, you know, we'll see flows come back as well. For the time being, for the next two, three trading sessions, volumes will be subpar. But what you could gather by looking at yesterday's screen as well, the Nifty is facing resistance at higher levels. And that's where we're seeing some bit of selling at higher levels. Mid caps, yes, that's the theme that has worked out very, very well. But in select pockets, you know, some caution could be warranted out there because there are select stocks that are moving up. And maybe it's not fundamentally back. So just be a little bit cautious in the broader markets. Some caution never hurts. Now, the financial services, the Nifty Financial Services Index, that plays out its weekly expiry today. So that's going to be one of those indices that we'll be tracking. For the Nifty yesterday, everything looked good, right? Everything looked good till the final 60 minutes. And the intraday chart will tell you. So till around 2.30 p.m., if you logged out, you would say, wow, what a good bullish start to the year. But in the last 60 minutes, the Nifty, the Nifty Bank, the Nifty Financial Services Index, all of them did come off uh, the top. So, you know, at around that 21,850, it appears we're seeing some bit of resistance that's coming in there. But the mid and the small caps, you know, yesterday as well, they outperformed. The Nifty ended more or less flattish. Both those two indices went home with gains of close to around half a percent. But select pockets out there are looking a little bit frothy. How the FI is positioned? Well, they're net long. We have been making this, uh, this point. That in absolute terms, it's 80,000 long contracts. In percentage terms, it's around 69%. I always prefer a market that's net short. That gives you that additional booster shot. But for the time being, we're net long. So let's see how that goes. You don't want that, you know, the net long positioning to go to around 100,000 contracts. Or we have seen when that happens in the past, we see a bit of a pullback. Options data, two active strikes out there with the highest amount of open interest. 70 lakh shares apiece. Now, getting to the numbers, you're just going by the options data, going by the trading action we saw. 21,850, 22,050, going by the options data, becomes a bit of a resistance zone. On the downside, since the 21,700 put has a fair bit of open interest, the premium's around 70 rupees, you have 21,670. That becomes the near-term support zone. The gift 50 was suggesting a bit of green, I think, to kick uh, start trade after yesterday's pullback. In fact, now it's suggesting that we pull back close to around 30 points odd. I think that 21,630 should hold out. If that holds out, then maybe make another dash towards 22,000 odd. But it seems the next few days we could be in this range of around 250 to around 300 points. Okay, all right. So we'll watch out for uh, the way those uh, cues shape up. Right now, let's get started with the equity call of the morning. Mahesh Nadurkar of Jeffrey says, resurgence of a multi-year capex upcycle implies robust 67% GDP growth over the next five to seven years. Potential slowdown in government capex in the upcoming budget is not a worry. Foreign investors' positioning on India is light and calendar year 24 should see greater inflows, which should help banking stocks. They like domestic cyclicals, that is banks, power, telecom, industrial, property, and their underweight on IT, consumer, and energy. They've also increased the underweight positioning on consumer and raised banks to an overweight. For stocks, Jeffries has trimmed positions in LNT and added Adani ports. 
Okay, interesting views coming in on the money markets as well this morning. On the rupee, Abhishek Goenka of IFA Global says that as we step into 2024, the flow pipeline looks quite promising. As financial conditions ease in the US and Europe, we should see a steady stream of FPI flows into domestic equities. If crude stays in the $70 to $85 per barrel range, the current account deficit too should be comfortable. Overall, he expects the dollar to trade with a weak bias in 2024 and the rupee to underperform amidst broad dollar weakness. According to him, the RBI will likely continue to wield significant control in 2024 as well as it keeps absorbing inflows and accumulates reserves to enhance external stability. The medium-term trading range for the rupee, according to Abhishek, is at 82.70 to 83.50 to the dollar. Okay, on bonds, Ajay Magnulia of JM Financial says demand in the last auction has firmed up yields, but volume was low yesterday. Stability of economic parameters like inflation, the current account deficit, low crude prices and better tax collections is comforting despite low liquidity in the system. He expects the 10-year benchmark yield to trade in a range of 7.18 to 7.22% for the day. Well, we've got a lot of stock-specific action track for you. Get to that in just a bit in our special top 10 segment. For the time being, we run you through the list. We're looking at Coal India, TVS Motors, Power Grid, Gensol, we have SRF and GR Infra. All of them will be reacting to positive news. Global on the flip side, Altec Cement, Aisha Motors, APL Apollo Tews, South Indian Bank will be reacting to negative news flow. Okay, so we'll get to all of those stocks in just a bit and tell you more about our top 10 list. But for the time being, let's get a global voice on this market. Steve Bryce, Chief Investment Officer, Standard Chartered Wealth Management, is with us now. Steve, good morning. Thank you for joining in. And first of all, season's greetings. Wish you a very, very happy new year. Well, 2023 was a great year for the Indian market. Uh, as you see India from your vantage point, how do we look for the new year? Yeah, I mean, we're um, still bullish on the Indian market. Obviously, if we look at the sort of macro picture, it still looks pretty supportive in terms of economic growth. Um, so earnings um, earnings growth is expected to remain bust. Uh, we see valuations as less stretched as they have been uh, in, in recent times as well. It's obviously not cheap relative to many markets around the world, but less stretched than they have been. Uh, and also investor positioning is expected to, to, to improve. Obviously, domestic flows are, are pretty strong. Um, and the international flows have been relatively muted uh, over the course of the past six to 12 months. So from that perspective, uh, we think the Indian market still looks looks pretty attractive um, with, with domestic growth really driving the picture. All right, Indian markets look attractive with domestic growth driving the picture. Uh, that seems to be the base case or the narrative for the last many months now, Steve. But how do you approach it sector-wise? I mean, do you have any preferences now in 2024? We're heading into technology earnings as well. How do you feel about that space? Or do you think banks could continue to take center stage? Well, I think one of the things that's factored into our um, sector views is really what's happening. And obviously, we're in a pre-election cycle now. Um, that's usually a, a good environment for stocks, just generally speaking. Uh, obviously, the government is likely to make sure that the economy remains robust. So uh, we're taking a bit of a barbell approach, actually globally as well, but also uh, in, in India. So we're overweight consumer discretionary. We think the consumer story is likely to remain uh, robust as we go through the first half of the year. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, continued government spending um, is a positive there. Um, also, on the industrial side, seeing incentives coming through for, for increased investment. That might only kick in the second half of the year, but that should be good for the uh, industrial space as well. So those are obviously the pro-cyclical elements of the market. And then we are overweight healthcare at the global level and in India as well. Uh, a bit more defensive in nature, of course, um, but that sort of barbell approach we think should set uh, investors up well for 2024. Hi, Steve. Uh, good morning and good to see you in Nigel on this side. Steve, what are, what are you factoring in from the Fed? You know, it seems global equity markets, they're talking about rate cuts and maybe a little more than what could come about in the first half of the year. For the year, how many are you factoring in? Yeah, so we're looking for around three rate cuts this year, but really, you know, kicking in in the second half of the year, right? So we still see, you, the, the, to us, the reading of the economy is, and obviously we're going to get important data today and obviously through the rest of this week as well, is that the U.S. market, the U.S. economy is coming in on a slower pace uh, as we go into 2024. 20, so obviously last year surprised on the upside, but we are seeing signs of that deceleration coming through. Together with this disinflationary trend that we're seeing, which is very strong disinflation now, 
uh, coming through. We think that is going to allow the Fed to ease monetary policy, even if they think the economy is not going into recession. Now, you know, the, the risks of a recession grow, in our opinion, as we go through the year. Um, but the first half looks looks you know slower, but still uh, still okay growth. Um, so those rate cuts will probably only come together when we get closer to two percent on the uh, on the core inflation measure. Mm -hmm. Okay, Steve. The thing is, we're starting off for 2024 on a, such a nice uh, Goldilocks sort of a you know uh, with an, with an outlook with Fed rate cuts, economy doing quite okay, and you know more foreign money coming in the market. That I keep asking all the experts that we get. Please tell us uh, what are the risks that we should bear in mind. I think geopolitics is, is a consensus risk that everyone talks about. But anything else that you would be a little watchful of? Uh, I think the, the, the elephant in the room is, is still do we get a recession in, in the States, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously the, the, the soft landing scenario or that narrative has picked up a lot over the course of the past three to six months as inflation has started to, to come down. Uh, from our perspective, that does mean, obviously, that, that it, real interest rates are now going up. Uh, quite significantly. So that is a tightening of financial conditions, uh, which, you know, obviously is a headwind for the for the economy as well. So we're not out of the woods yet. I mean, if you look historically, uh, a lot of the indicators that have a 100% track record of predicting recessions have been triggered. Um, so it would be in some ways miraculous if uh, the Fed was able to manage a soft landing. That said, as we head into 20, the beginning of 2024, uh, we believe that narrative is probably going to strengthen rather than weaken, which could lead to uh, the S&P 500, for instance, going on and testing uh, all-time highs. You know, uh, we wouldn't necessarily be confident at this stage projecting stock market gains through the second half of the year, um, but we think we're going to start on a pretty strong foot. All right, we'll start on a pretty strong foot. Uh, thanks a lot for that, Steve. Uh, thanks for your thoughts. And once again, Happy New Year to you and your entire team. And uh, hope you have a great 2024. Thanks for joining in. All right, let's take a quick break on that note on the other side of the break. Plenty of stocks to focus on this morning, so don't go anywhere. We'll be back in just a bit.
Welcome back. Well, our research team is standing by to give you the list of top 10 stocks for the day and plenty to talk about this morning. First up, Ultratech Cement on our list. Why are you looking at that? Well, after a while, Sonia, I think uh, the numbers are a little bit disappointing in comparison to what the street was uh, working with. So a little lower than some expectations on the street. Now, the India business, which has the grey volume, cement volumes, that's bulk of the business. Out there, the growth was only around 5%. Some were expecting a number in the high single digits. So that goes down as a bit of a disappointment. The overseas business, that gives some bit of a leg up because on a lower base, smaller part, it grew closer around 20%. And the consolidated number came in at around 27.3 million tons. Some on the street were expecting a number closer to around 28 million tons. So the overall growth is around 6%. The possible reasons why the volume growth is a little less than expected, one was that we had festive season. So out there, labor availability becomes a bit of an issue. Next up, you had some pollution-related issues, you know, in North India. You also had winters in North India. Sometimes, you know, that has, uh, that's a bit of a headwind for construction. Elections in select states, so that's why maybe off day got uh, affected in select states. And then you had, uh, you know, the, all of a sudden unseasonal rains in South India, which could have hurt as well. So put all this together, those numbers go down as a bit of a disappointment and a little lower than what some were expecting on the street. But Sonia, what about Aisha Motors? How were those numbers? So, you know, largely the auto uh, company is disappointed yes. in the month of December and Aisha Motors as well. Royal Enfield sales were disappointing, so I'm going with red over there. Uh, the total Royal Enfield sales fell 7% year on year and that just goes to show that the premium end of the market is seeing some moderation, uh, some slowdown in terms of growth. Uh, this is also lower than the CNBC TV18 poll. So Aisha Motors wholesale numbers came in at 63,387, while the poll that CNBC TV18 threw up was at 68,800 units, so much below what the poll threw up. Also, moderns, models with engine capacity of up to 350cc, which is the largest chunk of their segment, that was down 10% year-on-year at 55,400 units. So I'm going with red on Aisha Motors today. Okay, all right. I'm tracking a couple of more companies then which came out with their operational update. Coal India, that's been the stock that uh, has been a big outperform actually in the last 12 months or so. And they came out with an operational update which didn't look too bad. So that's why I'm expecting it to continue its upward trajectory. The production number was up by close to around 8% for the month of December. The offtake number was up by close to around 6%. Now, year to date, that's April till December, production has moved up by close to around 11%, which is very, very good. And normally you had that gap between production as well as dispatches because of evacuation concerns. Now they've been working on that. So that's why offtake as well isn't too bad at around 8.7%. Jefferies has come out with a note. They say at these uh, levels, well, on a, on a PE basis as well as on a dividend yield basis, it's quite attractive. So expecting the stock to continue its upward trajectory. The other one that I'm looking at is APL Apollo Tubes. Those numbers looked a little bit disappointing. But if you pull up APL Apollo Tubes, the last one month chart, you'll see in a roaring market, APL Apollo Tubes actually is down closer to around 5% uh, in the last one month. And from the peak in September, well, the stock has lost closer to around 15%. So maybe the street was sensing a bit of a disappointment showing and it is a little bit disappointing. So for the past quarter, the total volumes came at around 600,000 odd. That would mean that on a sequential basis, it's a bit of a degrowth and on a year on year basis, it's more or less flattish. One reason why those uh, volumes weren't that great is because there was channel destocking in anticipation of the steel price correction. So that's the key reason they mentioned this in their press release as well. The good news is though, VAP, that's uh, value added uh, products, that continues to move up from around the 55, 56%, it's moved to around 59% on. For the nine months, well, they still delivered a growth of closure around 19%, though for the past quarter, it was a little bit disappointing. And importantly, the new uh, capacity that they commissioned, that's a Raipur plan, well, out there, the utilization levels are steadily moving up. For the past quarter, it was 40%, but for the month of December, it was closer to around 50%. So expecting the stock to open up in the red. But Sonia, back to you. Okay, so TVS Motors, what I'm looking at. You know, at a time when most of the auto companies disappointed, this one actually did very well. So I'm going with green on TVS Motor. Good set of numbers, strong sales continue in December. It's a growth of 25% that TVS Motor has seen in its sales, coming in at a little over 3 lakh units. Now, the poll that we threw up came in at 3.14 lakh units, so not too much of a disappointment either. Very strong performance coming in. The two-wheeler segment saw a growth of 27% and that was led by very good growth in the scooter segment this time around. So scooter sales went up 34% year on year. I'm going with green here. The thing to remember in TVS Motors is that the stock has also seen a very big rally. It's up 50% in the last six months. So, you know, maybe some consolidation around these levels wouldn't harm anyone. Okay, you guys have had a breathless run. Lots of stocks between <laughs> the two of you, but uh, we also have Vivek joining in. He's watching out for a bunch of industrial stocks this morning. Vivek, uh, tell us more about them. 
Absolutely, quite a few stocks on the radar. First on the list is Pargrid, you know, management change coming in over there on the account of retirement of the incumbent. So, Sri Ravindra Kumar Tyagi assumes charge as the chairman and managing director, replacing Sri Srikant Kandikuppa. The second uh, news flow as far as Pargrid is concerned, the company has received another transmission project. So, received the letter of intent for a 20 gigawatt transmission system project in Rajasthan. Uh, the second stock on the radar is Gensol Engineering. The company is looking to raise up to 300 crore either via the QIP route or the preferential issue route. Uh, the third stock that we are tracking is SRF. Now, SRF you know, had earlier incorporated a subsidy known as SRF Alltech. Uh, now, this particular facility was set up for manufacturing of aluminium foil. The company has updated the exchanges yesterday saying that this particular facility has been commissioned and capitalized as an aggregate cost of over 536 crore. The last stock on the radar is GR Infra Projects. You know, the company has received a transmission project in Madhya Pradesh. This particular project was won by a bid in the TBCB project. Annual transmission charge that the company will get is 41.9 crores. Okay, all right. Thanks a lot for that, Vivek. Well, let's hop across to Abhishek. He's tracking South Indian Bank, which came up with their update as well. Morning, Abhishek. Uh, morning, Nigel. So, South Indian Bank did come up with its operational update and on a YOI basis, it looked to be on the weaker side and they might have lost market share. Uh, so, uh, uh, CASA ratio continues to deplete over there. That's another negative over there. So, deposits are up 9.5% YOI and about 2% sequentially. Uh, the CASA is up in absolute value just 2.8% YOI and about 1.4% sequentially. So, you are seeing a dip in the CASA ratio, both YOI as well as quarter on quarter. Advances growth is at 10.8% YOY and about 3.7% sequentially. The CD ratio, credit deposit ratio has improved both YOY and quarter on quarter as well. Back to you. Okay, got that. Uh, thank you very much, Abhishek, for the details. Let's quickly recap our uh, top 10 list for this morning. The stocks that have positive news flow around them are Coal India, TVS Motors, Power Grid, uh, Gensol Engineering, SRF and GR Infra. The ones that have negative news around them are Ultratech Cement, Aisha Motors, APL Apollo Tubes and South Indian Bank. Okay, so that's the top 10 list for today. Let's now move over to equities. Uh, let's now move over from equities to commodities and uh, bring in Manisha Gupta for a roundup of all the action. Manisha, good morning. What do you have your eye on today? Shurmi, thank you so much for that. Well, a better day as more and more countries come back for participation uh, for 2024. And uh, what we are dealing with is a weaker China manufacturing data for the month of December. That doesn't do well. So we've seen a bit of a pressure come in for the metals today. The volumes are still on the lower side. Uh, remember, the Japanese markets are shut till 4th of Jan, and there's not so much great news coming in from that country as well. Apart from that, it is going to be the U.S. on now that comes in on Friday, and this is the first indicator in this year on when, how much of interest rate cut can we start to anticipate in the first quarter already. So this is what the street will watch out for. But as in terms of prices, it is the crude oil prices which continue to move the most. We've started on a positive note right now. There are uh, reports about U.S. forces striking back at Houthi Group in Red Sea. And there are also reports now of Tehran sending warship into Red Sea. So this is uh, a situation that doesn't seem to be de-escalating anytime soon. And we are seeing a premium of that build up in case of food prices. So positive start and positive moves coming in today as well. All right. Thanks a lot for that, Manisha. Have a good day. Let's take a quick break. On the other side of the break, Amnisha Garwal, Head of Research at Prabhuda Siladar, will be joining in to discuss some fundamental stocks. We'll also be joined by Shashank Srivastava, the Senior Executive Marketing and Sales at Maruti to discuss more on the company's December performance. Do stay tuned in.
Welcome back. Hope you're having a good morning. The gift fifty is suggesting some bit of red just to kick start trade. 20, 30 points down, but I think volumes will continue to remain subpar. But plenty of stocks to discuss. Abneesh Agarwal, head of research at Prabhuda Sridhar, joins us on the show. Hi, Abneesh. Uh, good to see you in, and thanks so much uh, for joining. And wishing you a very good 2024 ahead. Well, uh, uh, Abneesh, uh, tell us about a couple of stocks that we're looking at this morning, namely Ultratech Cement. You know, after a while, I've seen they've come out with a quarterly update that's been a little bit disappointing. What's your view on the stock? You know, the growth for the past quarter is just 5% on a year-on-year -year basis. Your take? Yeah, uh, good morning and uh, happy new year to you also. Now, as far as the Ultratech cement is concerned, I think cement companies last quarter, the margins were better, although the volumes, they have not been that great. So I think in the near term, you might see I would say some sort of, a, you can say, pressure building up in the stock that the stocks may not do anything great, particularly because we are just, say, a few months away from the elections, and usually there's a three to six months lull, you can say, before the election and even after the elections. So in the medium term, I think the <clears throat> growth rate for the industry at 7 to 8%, that remains intact. Uh, however, in the near term, there could be, say, some aberrations here or there, and... Uh, I think looking at that, if the stock dips or there is some lull in between, then one can look at, say, entering these stocks. Okay. Uh, Amnish, hi. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. Of course, see season's greetings wish you a happy new year, first of all. Uh, let's get in your thoughts on uh, Frontline Auto, the OEMs, because we were all going through the numbers, uh, the December numbers. Most companies have been slightly shy of expectations. Now, stocks have run up. I mean, let's take the example of a Hero or a Bajaj Auto. Stocks have had a pretty good run, or even a Tata Motors for that matter. Uh, which ones are you still backing in 2024 in terms of a fresh purchase? Well, you see, if you look at the entire auto pack, uh, earlier the rally was led by your commercial vehicles, followed by PVs, and in the past couple of months, even two wheelers have joined, whether it is a Bajaj or a Hero. Now, there are different factors for all the three segments. If you look at, in particular, say, CVs, I think CV is, it is not only this month, on the last couple of months, it is showing some sort of a, I would say, uh, some sort of a top out kind of a situation that the volume seems to be, uh, you can say, picking out and the growth incrementally would be not like what we have seen in the last two, three years. Mm -hmm. Now, if the operating leverage continues to come in, then we might see the improved performance even, say, in the current year, so maybe for another six months or so. However, I think uh, now we are entering a phase where the returns in the, your particularly the commercial vehicle stocks, that, that would be relatively measured. When it comes to passenger vehicles, I think where you can see whether you look at the numbers of Maruti or you look at, say, m, &M and all, m, m in particular has been doing well, mainly because of the, I think, UV segment is doing very well for them. Uh, Maruti has been slightly, I would say, uh, below expectations. But having said that, we still believe that uh, the entire, you can say, the PV segment offers more, uh, you can say, legs to growth for, say, the next year or two. So PVs should be one segment where still, I would say, that there is, uh, there is ample room for growth even from the current levels. Got now, it. When it comes... I will... Avnish, uh, we'll just take the cue from there since you're talking about Maruti, right? Uh, we have the management with us. So I just wanted to, you to listen in to that conversation as well. Uh, as Avnish was pointing out, the auto sales in December for Maruti were on the weaker side. Total sales coming in below CNBC TV18's poll. Domestic sales also contracted for Maruti, although exports surged 23%. Shashank Srivastava, the senior executive marketing and sales at Maruti Suzuki, joins us now to discuss more on their December performance. Mr. Shivastava, always a great speaking to you. And at the start of the year, let me wish you a very, very happy new year. Uh, you know, the wholesales are down a tad bit this time, right? One and a half percent year on year. Uh, within that, domestic sales are down six percent. Can you tell us what is the outlook on retail sales? How was it in December and what's the expectation? So for the month of December, as I've explained before, uh, that uh, normally all uh, OEMs in the industry, um, as also Marty Suzuki, we try to keep the stock levels to a minimum. So at the uh, at the end of the year, uh, the stock level is minimum. Uh, and that's the reason why typically December month, you will see low wholesale, but a very high retail. And that's what we started the month with. 
we plan to have low wholesale and a high retail. And that's exactly how it panned out. In fact, the retail for Maruti Suzuki um, uh, uh, for, for, for December um, uh, was about 230,900 units, which has been the highest ever uh, in our history. So, and that was uh, a good growth over last year's number of 201,700. That's a growth of about 12 and a half percent over last year. Uh, Mr. Srivastava, uh, hi, good morning and uh, season's greetings to you. Just want to talk about that export number, which is 26,884 versus 21,951. That's a month-on-month -month comparison. So what has led to this increase and do you think it can be sustained? Of course, uh, for the month of uh, November, there were a couple of shipments that we missed out towards the end, which get reflected in the December figures. But even if you look at the cumulative numbers, both for this year and in fact for the calendar year, uh, the sale or uh, the exports have done very well. Uh, our exports have been 269,050 uh, odd vehicles, which is uh, the highest ever export that we have uh, done in a calendar year. And uh, that's a good growth over last year's uh, uh, exports. I think uh, exports have been doing well and we do hope that even in the financial year, we will be uh, increasing substantially our numbers over last year. Well, good to see you in, Mr. Shavastava. And, uh, you know, in 2023, you crossed an annual sales of around 20 lakh units in a calendar year. My question to you is, how much better can 2024 be? Yeah, so maybe I'll not be able to give you a forward-looking number for Maruti uh, because there could be market moving. Uh, however, for the industry, uh, the this year, uh, with about 41.1 lakh sale, it is, this is a pretty high base. So, uh, uh, so far, uh, our research shows that on this high base, you will see um, uh, the growth levels next year to be slightly muted. So, I would expect a single-digit growth over this year or next year. Okay. All right. Expect a single-digit growth. Can you tell us the SUV segment is growing very well? What has the growth been in this month gone by? What is the volume and what's the revenue market share right now? For us, for this calendar year, um, uh, SUVs, of course, um, was uh, very big because, uh, uh, you know, uh, in terms of uh, the overall numbers, we could manage in this year 395,000 SUVs. This is against uh, 165,000 SUVs of last year. There's been a substantial jump over last year in terms of our sale. Uh, I don't have the exact uh, revenue uh, uh, percentage, but I would guess it's very high because uh, uh, at least about uh, 18, 20% up because um, the mid SUV share has also gone up uh, over last, uh, much of the share is because of mid SUVs going up our Grand Vitara, 114,000 this year against just 34,000 of last year. That's in the slightly on the higher price uh, side. So uh, the revenues also should go up, although at this point, I'm not able to give you the exact number. Should be around the 18, 20% range. Okay, got that. Um, uh, Mr. Srivastava, what is the uh, the order book position now? Last time you gave us a number of uh, 250,000. So where is it at present? It is around 215,000 now as of 1st of January. Uh, let's just talk about, you know, the comparative intensity as well, particularly perhaps in the SUV space. How have discounts been in the third quarter? Uh, because in the second quarter, the average discounting was about 17,700 rupees uh, at an average per unit. So what's the picture in Q3? It should be in that 18,000, 19,000 range, slightly higher than Q2. And in December alone would be even slightly higher than that maybe the 20,000, uh, 20,500 uh, type of uh, number. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, as I mentioned, uh, December discount levels were some of the highest that we have seen because of this uh, pressure to bring the stock levels down and therefore push for larger retails. And that also is what I explained uh, for was the reason for the lower wholesale, the much higher retails. All right, Mr. Srivastava, have you seen any kind of pickup in demand, particularly at the entry-level segment? So, uh, currently, they are around 30% of the overall passenger vehicle. Uh, last year, they were about 35%. So, there is a, a fall there. However, 
we are uh, expecting that uh, this would be stable for this next financial year and also the next calendar year. So this year, the industry uh, sale uh, for the uh, small cars is about 12 lakh 20 thousand. So I would expect it to be around the same level in that uh, 12 lakh to 12.5 lakh level for next year. All right. What was the growth like in the month of December in both the rural as well as the urban area? If you can share that with us. So rural versus urban, rural, uh, the, you know, December month, uh, um, uh, after many months, urban did a little better than uh, rural. In the month of uh, December, uh, urban growth was 12.1%, 11.9% was the rural growth. But if you look at the cumulative uh, year, let's say the calendar year, Jan to December, rural growth has been 10.4% against urban growth of 7.3%. And for April to December, that's the financial year that uh, we work by, rural growth 12.3% against 8.9% for urban. So uh, still uh, rural growth higher, but um, uh, December was a little lower than the urban growth. Uh, our penetration is uh, roughly around 44%. Uh, is the rural penetration, whereas for the industry, the penetration is estimated to be around 31-32 percent. Mm, interesting trends there. So urban finally catching up with rural in December. Finally, sir, uh, what about market share? Just give us the numbers. I mean, overall passenger vehicles and specifically in the SUV segment. Market share, uh, because our growth in the uh, calendar year was slightly higher than the industry, the industry growth was 8.3%, our growth was 8.4%. As a result, our market share went up marginally uh, to about 41.6% uh, 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 for the for the uh, Canon 41.7% over 41.5% of last year. Uh, uh, retail market share uh, estimated in December, of course, was pretty large. As we said, our retails in December was large and, and, and our expect and our retails uh, market share in December alone was uh, in fact in excess of 50%. For the SUV, our market share uh, uh, is just above 20%. Last year it was 10.5%, so it sort of doubled over last year in this calendar year. Well, it's been a good year for you, specifically uh, on that SUV fight, Maruti making strong inroads there. Thank you very much for joining in and once again wish you a very, very happy 2024. Well, with that, we will take a quick break. Coming up on the other side, we'll have, of course, the market setup chat with Anuj. He'll join in. Of course, we bring you all the top stock picks, uh, the trading ideas, and, of course, the uh, FNO bets that you could be looking at today.
Welcome back here with us on Bazaar Morning Call. Time to head across to Anuj to figure out how he's reading the setup. Uh, Anuj, uh, good morning. So it seemed all very well, and then you had that drama play out in the last half an hour, right? The volatility. What do you make of things, and uh, how do you look at today? Yes, morning, Surbhi, Nigel, Sonia, and uh, happy New Year to all of you. But uh, I think we didn't get a chance to talk yesterday, but uh, I, I, that's okay. The market will have that with low volume trade. I mean, yesterday the FI gross volumes were so low. I, you know, I think there's uh, some areas in Mumbai which will be generating more volumes than what we had from FI <laughs> yesterday. Uh, now, you know, that's the level to watch out for. The nifty low of last three days, uh, it's been similar. Around 21,675 there about December 28, December 29 and Jan 1. So in some sense, while the market's been seeing intraday uh, declines, it's holding on to a crucial level. But, you know, the one-way move that the market had might be coming to an end. There could be some volatility in the month of January for two reasons. The earnings season kicks off soon and of course you have the pre-budget uh, volatility also which could take place. Uh, I mean, uh, that's been the trend. January has been a volatile series if you remember for last four or five years. Uh, uh, the two levels that I'm watching out for yesterday's high and low, 21.834 and 21.680 on the nifty uh, and again there was mid cap outperformance which was the theme in 2023 yesterday also you saw mid cap outperformance in terms of cues to track of course you want to track the bond yield and dollar index there's been a one way decline in that uh, but uh, some support at lower levels let's see if the there's another round of uh, uh, you know lower levels that you see in these two uh, sort of instruments uh, uh, because that would be having some bearing on the FI flows as we start the next year uh, generally you make fresh allocations at the start of january once you're back from uh, the holidays and yesterday the volumes were five percent of overall volumes from the fi desk uh, coming to nifty and bank nifty on the nifty the first resistance is 21834 which is yesterday's high and then of course uh, 22000 the highest options base uh, on the lower side the support is well defined 21677 like we saw over the last three days uh, the recent low and then 21600 where the maximum put open interest buildup is uh, placed uh, on the bank nifty which has been more volatile where you didn't make an all-time high yesterday while you did on the nifty uh, the first resistance is 48450 yesterday's high and then of course the all-time high of 48636 but i think support is more important to talk here first 48044 yesterday is low and then 47800 uh, based on the options okay anuj thanks a lot for that and uh, happy new year to you i hope this uh, year continues to be a great one just like the previous one thanks for joining in Amnish Agarwal is still sitting by with us. Amnish, thanks for waiting by patiently. Uh, the big trigger to watch now will be earnings season, right? You have both Infosys and TCS coming out on the 11th of Jan. What is your expectation this time around and how are you going into the tech earnings? I think for tech, one should not expect any fireworks to happen in the near term. So in the past uh, two, three quarters, we have seen the muted earnings, not so great a guidance. And I think that trend might continue, say, for another quarter or so, maybe from the uh, one Q next year or two Q, then we will start to see, you can say, things stabilizing and uh, the companies reporting some sort of an improvement in the demand and outlook. Right. Uh, Amnesh, you know, I wanted to ask you about the structural steel tube space. I'm not sure whether you track it, but we have APL Apollo tubes that those numbers are a little bit flattish, uh, you know, which is a little bit disappointing. But a far smaller player is JTL Industries. You know, they have been making the right sounds. Out there, they gave a big... Uh, uh, you know, volume update. Would you stick to the leader or do you think some of these smaller players on a low base with valuations in favor, they could find preference? You see, I'm uh, not closely tracking the space, but usually what happens in some of these industries is that the market leader always has much bigger size than some of these, you can say, merging of the mid-sized players. And whenever the industry is in the growth phase, then we have all, uh, always seen that Beyond, uh, you can say, size, the growth rate of, you can say, the emerging players, particularly when the uh, when there is uh, good demand, that far outstrips the growth of the market leader. We have seen to this panning out, whether you can say in segment, segment like paints, in segments like, say, adhesives, okay, etc. So I think in the similar way here also, I think the smaller players in all these, you can say, segments which are order-driven, which are driven by the increased infrastructure which are happening, so these companies have the potential to grow much faster than the larger players. Mm, okay, uh, got that. Amnesh, uh, good talking to you this morning. Thank you very much for uh, joining in and you have a good day uh, going ahead. Time now to talk uh, trades and technicals. We have Mitesh Thakkar as well as Kush Bora joining in for exactly that. Gentlemen, good morning. Good to have you with us as always. 
uh, and uh, you know once again seasons greetings to both of you uh, mitesh let me start with you i mean how are you reading uh, the way the setup is placed right now which is discussing this with anuj that we're getting these small bouts of volatility here and there uh, would you still be a buyer on uh, on the index on the nifty and what about the bank nifty which is failing to show consistent sustained uptrend seasons reading to you and the entire viewers of uh, cnbc I think in the short term, there are first signals of profit booking. You know, the hourly and the two hourly charts are now showing indicators which are slightly turning south from overbought levels. Typically, and in, in most of the cases, I think, you know, this is a signal of some kind of a deeper pullback than what we have seen for the last few days. So I think there should, there, there, there should be some profit, uh, profit booking happening uh, across the board for most of the indices as well as stocks. And you would see some selling pressure at higher levels. My initial belief is that the Nifty, you know, could possibly uh, test 21,500. And in the worst case scenario, in case there's some negative news, then 21,250, 200 zones could be tested. Similarly, on the bank Nifty, I'm penciling in a test of 47,500 in the next few days. And 47,150, 200 is the near-term worst case scenario. So I think next few days, my idea would be to, one, be nimble in taking profits in long positions. Two, I think we would exploring some shorting opportunities at higher levels. If not directly in future segment, then maybe via put options. All right. Uh, Kush Bora is also with us. Kush, hi. Good morning. Happy New Year to you. Uh, how are you feeling about today? And in general, what's your take on the market now? You know, we have some big events coming up. There's earnings season, there's the budget, there's election season. So there could be a lot of volatility in the market at these levels. How are you feeling about that? And what are the levels to watch? Hi, Sonia. First up, a very happy New Year to you and your entire team at CNBC. Well, I, I don't think a couple of hundred points of pullback will be a surprise from, for anyone from here on, right? Uh, we've seen a stellar run in the last week of December and, you know, perhaps we're due a, pro, you know, a, due a round of uh, profit booking. So I think 21,300, 21,200 is a strong support zone where the market could, uh, you know, head to. But I believe that this market will perhaps go up before it goes down. So 22,000 to 22,200 is the range that we've been talking about for a while. And that, uh, you know, could also very well be the near-term top for the market, uh, you know, before the, before we begin a dash, you know, again, uh, northwards. But 22,000, 22,200 is where we see the nifty headed. And, uh, you know, once that is taken out, as I said, you know, that could be the near-term, you know, top for the market. Just for today, I think there will be some pressure, you know, that will start playing. Today is the Fin Nifty expiry and then following Bank Nifty and the Nifty expiry. So I think we'll be in a range with a slight negative bias. My concern is the Bank Nifty, where the setup is not too encouraging. For the year, however, I believe that, you know, the Bank Nifty will outperform the Nifty, you know, for the uh, 2024 calendar year. But just for now, the setup doesn't look so encouraging. Uh, it's a bit stressed. So I think 47,800 is my first uh, target on the Bank Nifty on the way down. 47,800. Got that. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Kush, you go first. Tell us what about individual stocks. Uh, okay, actions are plenty. So I have two picks, both on the buy side. First one is Ambuja Cement. Uh, the stock is actually doing, you know, very well. It had actually made a new high before it, uh, you know, sort of came down with the markets. But even then, you know, uh, a very strong closing. So from here on as well, uh, you know, a near-term target of 545, 555, and 525 is where I would place my stop loss. My second pick is Trill, Transformers and Rectifiers. This stock too, even on declines, has taken its uh, you know, support on the 20-day moving average very strongly. And the trajectory is upwards. The volumes are also seeing a pickup on uh, you know, some uh, days when the stock's ending in the positive. So uh, Transformers and Rectifiers, 245, 250, the near-term target. 235 is where I would place my stop loss. But 275 is the positional target that we have on TRIL. Okay, all right, Kush, got that. Um, Mitesh, let me come to you as well. Individual stocks, what are you trading today? Uh, I have a mix of buys and sells. Uh, on the buying side is granules, which had a good breakout on Friday, uh, on Monday, or uh, yesterday. Uh, that's a buy with a stop at 403 for a target of around 432. Oracle Finance is a buy as well. Keep a stop below 4270 here. Look for a target of around 4485, 4490 to begin with, and then we'll look at higher levels. On the selling side, you know, I expect uh, two very strong and outperforming stocks to see a pullback. One of them is Birla Soft, B Soft. That's a sell with a stop at 717 for a target of 670 in the near term. And DLF also could see uh, some kind of profit booking. So sell here with a stop at 734 half. Look for a target of around 700. 
All right, thanks a lot for that. Uh, let's take a quick break. On the other side of the break, we have the pre-opening rates. We'll also be speaking to Jay Kale of Elara Capital. The auto sales were disappointing in the month of December. What went wrong? What is the prognosis? Stay tuned for more on that. Welcome back. Just a few minutes to go before we get the pre-open rates. But for the timing, let's get you some derivative action and some derivative trades as well. Manoj Mulidharan joins us to help us out with exactly that. Hi, Manoj. Good morning. Hope you had a good start to 2024. Tell us how you you viewing trading action first, a couple of strategies, both on the Nifty as well as individual stocks. Uh, good morning, Nigel. First of all, wishing your uh, entire team of CNBC a very happy new year. Uh, Nigel, uh, this this month of Jan, if you see the Nifty has started with the highest positioning, uh, at least I guess in the last two years that we have seen almost 1 crore 25 odd lakh. So uh, intra month, if you see, you know, the open interest of the positioning in the Nifty goes to around 1.35 crores. So that leaves us with hardly 10 odd lakh. So we believe that at least for this fourth uh, December, which is your first weekly, uh, fourth Jan, I'm sorry, which is your first weekly expiry, 21,700 strike has seen good amount of call and put writing. We call it as a short straddle with a 250 or rupees premium. So we believe 21,450 to 500 as a support and a resistance closer to 21,900. That might be the trade for the next two days. Intraday, the first support in the Nifty would be closer to 21,550. That's on the spot. And the resistance can be closer to a 700, 750. So Nifty is not doing much. We expect a range bound session. This can go on possibly till the 11th or the 12th as well when the result season starts. So a range bound session with the IVs close to 14% is where we are seeing uh, in the Nifty. Stock specific, we believe that uh, Prompton has done good and the uh, stock is seen good positioning in this uh, month as well. So we are expecting a good move in that. With 330 as a target, uh, we recommend buying that the stock should be 306. From the pharma sector, we like Zyder. This is strictly cash-based delivery call that we recommend at this point of time with a target of 720. The stop loss should be somewhere close to a 704 in that. 
Thanks a lot for that. Appreciate your thoughts. Uh, that is Manoj Muridharan of Relic Broking. But let's get to the auto sector now. The big headline is that the December auto sales have been largely disappointing. Also, remember the government has now extended the PLI scheme for the auto and auto component industry by a year till FY28. What does all of this mean for the stocks in focus? Jay Kale, Senior Vice President Research at Elara Capital joins us now with his call on the sector. Jay, hi, good morning. I want to start with the two-wheeler sector first because there's been a... Uh, you know, uh, very varied numbers coming in there. On one hand, TVS Motors numbers were very good. But on the other hand, Aisha Motors disappointed with Royal Enfield. What would you do this month? Uh, or rather, what would you do on the stocks now? Yeah, I mean, you know, we have seen, uh, you know, and firstly, uh, wish you a very happy new year and the team at CNBC. Uh, uh, you know, yes, we have seen on uh, on the two-wheeler side uh, some varied numbers coming in from players. Uh, mind you, you know, Aisha was also impacted to a certain extent by uh, the Tamil Nadu uh, of floods, but you know, so to say, uh, you know, they should have kind of ramped up uh, post uh, that. Uh, we have seen some bit of pressure on Royal Enfield numbers uh, since uh, recent months, especially with the competition coming in of Harley and uh, uh, Triumph as well. Uh, on TVS side, you know, we've seen uh, them coming back or uh, coming from a very good festive season. Uh, so, you know, the dealer inventory was at comfortable levels. Uh, and, uh, you know, that has helped them in posting decent numbers in uh, December as well. Even if you see Wahan retail uh, growth numbers for uh, December, they have been pretty encouraging uh, for TVS as well as the industry. Uh, yes, RE has struggled uh, in this month. And I think, uh, you know, going forward with uh, capacities for competition in this segment ramping up, uh, we, their numbers would be tested in the following month. So we prefer TVS over Aisha uh, in the two leader space. I just had one follow-up question on TVS. You prefer TVS over Aisha in the two-wheeler space, but if you look at the valuations, right, TVS is now trading at 30 times forward. I mean, if you compare Bajaj, Hero, they're still at about 17, 18 times. Wouldn't you be concerned about the valuation, uh, the, the valuations of TVS Motor now? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, almost all stocks have are now trading uh, higher than their historical average. And even in historical average, TVS has traded higher than the other uh, two wheeler players mainly because of you know their the potential of high earnings growth uh, with structural margin uh, increases uh, potential of structural margin increase for TVS being there uh, with their product portfolio and market share increase across segments uh, happening and of course exports uh, coming off a very low base now should uh, you know slowly and steadily uh, recover so you know it, it is underpinned the premium valuation is also underpinned by a relatively higher earnings growth for TVS uh, going forward and uh, them uh, being better placed now on the EV scooter side as well. Uh, so yes, valuations are frankly, uh, to a certain extent, a concern for the entire auto sector, uh, given that uh, almost all OEMs and ANS are trading above their historical average. Uh, but from a structural business perspective, I think TBS Motor is uh, pretty well placed. Mm, okay, that's TBS Motors on the two-wheeler pack. Uh, Jay, hi, morning and happy new year to you. What about passenger vehicles? Which uh, which stock would you back for 2024? We were just uh, in conversation with uh, Mr. Srivastava of Maruti. We were discussing how Maruti has doubled its uh, SUV market share. They're talking single-digit I mean, growth for the calendar year as such. Uh, what's your call? PVs, what's the best bet? Yeah, I think, you know, PVs, uh, you know, going for, we've seen uh, a lot of SUVization going. I mean, premiumization trend has continued uh, for calendar year 2023. Uh, and, you know, the strong order books for the companies uh, were reflected in their SUV numbers uh, going uh, into the festive season as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, we have seen, uh, you know, Maruti uh, as a case, if I have to see, I, at least now we have confirmed that their products in the premium segment have been well accepted in the market. You know, uh, a few years back, there were uh, concerns whether uh, Maruti's brand will be accepted in the higher price point segment. I think that is now well established that, uh, some of the products like Grand Vitara, Brezza, uh, even, uh, you know, Franks to a certain extent, you know, that they have been pretty well uh, established now with the SUV market share increasing. Uh, what is a concern for them, of course, is the entry level segment uh, is still declining. And I think uh, uh, we believe that that is largely bottoming out uh, currently, uh, while SUVs will continue to grow stronger for them. Uh, but I think the bottoming out of, uh, you know, entry level car segment, uh, will be supportive of their volume market share as well. If you see the revenue market share has far exceeded, the revenue market share increase for them has far exceeded their volume market share increase. Uh, but I think with entry level kind of bottoming out, their uh, volume market share should also get some support. So we prefer Maruti in the passenger vehicle space uh, uh, over here. 
So Maruti for uh, PVs uh, for 2024. PVs, on a side, yes. oh god, god, that. Jay, on a side note, you know, since this happened last evening, I just want to throw this at you as well. The extension of the auto PLI, right? There's a one-year extension that's come through. Uh, just give us your overall sense on purely from a stock point of view. Uh, you know whether this could excite any, you know, any of the majors, either the bigger companies or even uh, the the component manufacturers in the ecosystem. Would you watch for anything? Because there's this one-year PLI extension now. I think most of them, you know, uh, you know, they've, they've spoken of uh, them applying, and you know, approvals are in various stages uh, currently for various companies. We've heard one or two OEMs uh, speak about them getting approval. The others, you know, this will add a significant cushion to their margins in the EV space, which initially are will be uh, very thin. Uh, we have, uh, you know, heard about OEMs talking of. Uh, including PLI, they are uh, EV margins being similar to ICE margins. So this is a significant component for OEMs when they transition from ICE to EVs in cushioning their margins and hence becoming more competitive uh, in the marketplace. So OEMs who will uh, get this PLI and get that approved uh, as soon as possible will definitely have better pricing power in the market, especially in the EV space uh, where uh, margins are relatively thinner in the initial period. Okay, Jay, we leave it at that. Thanks a lot for joining in. Appreciate your thoughts. By the way, the pre-opening rates are setting very flat right now. So, just consolidating around the 21,700 mark. Coal India is the one that's stopping the charts on the back of good production data that came in. This time around, Tata Motors is up 1.5%. And on the downside, Aisha Motors, no uh, prizes for guessing that one. It's been weak this time around. Royal Enfield sales down 7%. But we begin a brand new year and we thought we'll put out some uh, top bets by brokerages of for 2024. And Nimesh is here to give us the lowdown. Nimesh, good morning. Hi, morning, Sonia. So, you know, after a stellar 2023, all eyes will be on 2024. So we've looked at the strategy piece of some large influential brokerages and identified the key sector and, and stock calls. I'll start with Jeffries first. Uh, they believe that uh, they like the domestic cyclical, so, uh, which includes banks, power, telecom, industrials and property. They're underweight on IT, consumer and energy. And within consumer, they further increase their underweight on, on the consumer names and, and they've raised banks to overweight. Within the large caps, uh, Jeffries has trim a bit on l and and they've added Adani Port. So that's an interesting name that they've added in the model portfolio. Now, uh, coming to Bernstein, uh, they have a big call uh, and, and, and that is something uh, that they're advising clients to book profits now. That's, that's, that's a big call from, from Bernstein. And within that, uh, they have now turned, uh, they've downgraded small and mid cap to underweight relative to Nifty. And the key reason is they are, they are finding it very, very difficult to justify the valuations for most of the stocks that they cover. Within the sectors, they continue to be overweight on financials. Uh, interestingly, they have upgraded uh, within I, uh, IT services within the technology uh, to overweight and they continue to be downgraded on consumer tech within the tech space. Uh, in terms of other sectors, they have upgraded telecom to overweight now. They have an equal weight on metals and they stay overweight on healthcare as well. Interestingly, while they are positive on the, on the sector, they have downgraded both uh, real estate and uh, cement to equal weight. And lastly, uh, within the, uh, they are going to be very selective in some pockets like consumer, industrials and utilities. So that's a big call from Bernstein. Now coming to City, uh, even they believe that while the, while the flows can continue in the, in the small and mid-cap funds, which can you know, lead the mid-cap outperformance, but they see the risk reward more favored towards the large cap. So, Within large caps, they're overweight on sectors which includes PSU utilities, defense, industrials, bank, and insurance. Uh, they continue to be underweight on discretionary IT as well as in materials. Now, uh, interestingly, they've put out five contrarian calls for 2024, which includes HDFC Bank, Sipla, Deviani, Indus Tower, and Endurance. So these are the five contrarian bets that City is betting on. Okay, all right. Thanks a lot uh, for that, Nimesh. Uh, well, it's 9.10, so let's get Mitesh back. Uh, Mitesh, what's your 9.10 call? Oh, Nigel, I will go with a buy on granules. Uh, look for targets of uh, 430 plus here. Okay, got that. Uh, thanks for that, Mitesh. We'll come back to you uh, in the next half hour or so to get a quick update as well in terms of market action. But Mangalam joins us to tell us about the stock that he's seeing, you know, in terms of uh, in our momentumizer segment. Mangalam? Well, the stock that did well in yesterday's trading session was JBM Auto, and that's on my momentumizer list. Why do I say that? Because it's got strong momentum behind it. 2023 also, it was a year of big gains for it, up almost 200 odd percent. And importantly, at a time when average traded volumes in the overall market itself were lower, 
this stock saw average traded volume of nearly three and a half times. In fact, yesterday's delivery stats were nearly five times what we've seen in all of December. 2.75 lakh shares were marked for delivery. This compares with just around 56,000 shares in all of December on an average. Remember last week itself, the company joined us here on CNBC TV18 and said that they will surpass 5,000 crores of revenue this year, with nearly one third of it coming in from their e-buses segment. Of the 5,000 e-buses orders that they have, 2,000 will be delivered in this year, and the next year will have 3,000 e-buses itself. So those are a couple of factors that are working for JBM Auto along with Momentum behind it. Okay, all right, got that, uh, Manglam. So that's JBM Auto, but don't go away. Our ordering on Zomato, that's about to get more expensive. Yeah. That has gotten more expensive, <laughs> but importantly, you know, it was a little more expensive on December 31st as well. This morning, there's mm. a note that is coming from CLSA that said that uh, the news reports have suggested that the companies increased their platform fee by about uh, 3 to 4 rupees itself, from 3 rupees to 4 rupees. And these calculations, as per CLSA, offset about 25% of the impact of GST on delivery charge itself. Remember, the company on December 31st also temporarily hiked the platform fee to rupees 9. And this was the day where the company delivered its highest ever orders. So that's an important mark and this signals an intent to use a more dynamic approach towards this platform fee. That means if there are higher orders, then platform fees could be increased and that could, you know, optimize their performance a lot more. As a result of which, the stock which has been doing well already, CLSA says, can go all the way up to 168 rupees. They have a buy rating. Oh. Okay, well, I we're going to order either way, right? <laughs> that's what that's what's been happening so far, at least, uh, whether the prices are hiked or not. But BHL is the other one in focus. Vivek is here uh, to tell us why. You need to watch that one. Vivek, over to you. Well, absolutely right. The first thing is, you know, yesterday while we were reporting, quoting newspaper reports that uh, you know, the company is most likely going to receive the order from NLC India, yesterday the company clarified to the exchanges that as of now they've still not received the order, but they did participate in the tendering process. Uh, but that hasn't stopped, you know, sell-side analysts from going ahead and analyzing this important and large order win. So Antique today has come out with an interesting note on BHL. They've maintained a buy stance with a target price of 230 rupees. Now uh, They have given a pr you know price to earnings multiple of 26 times FI20 six earnings. Now, what they're saying is that with this order win, if uh, BHL does indeed uh, manage to get it, uh, the order intake for FI24 will cross 60,000 crores if it is done in FI24 itself. Marks the potential of a significant turnaround in the ordering cycle, and they believe earnings are expected to increase fivefold between FI24 to FI26. Now, along with that, strategically, BHL is transforming itself into a diversified engineering company. On the other hand, Haitong, you know, also has come out at the norm. They have an underperformed rating with a target price of 73 rupees. Uh, they have, you know, the multiple that they have is uh, 20 times September 25 earnings. They believe that, you know, with this particular order win, order prospects are quite strong. But despite that, so far, they have not yet upgraded their rating or their target price. All right, thanks a lot for that. We have just about 40 seconds left for the markets to open for today and looks like it's going to be a sideways opening for the market. Remember, yesterday you saw a little bit of that dip volatility post uh, late trade. Uh, there was, of course, that tsunami warning, etc. So maybe that was used as an opportunity to sell. But otherwise, the market momentum is very much intact and we head into a lot of big events like the earning season, which kickstarts on the 11th of January. So all eyes will be on that. But here's the first take on the index. So very, very quiet as we were expecting. I think for Foreign investors are not back, you know, post their holiday as well. So this week will be kind of slow. Uh, down about 20 odd points for the Nifty, hanging on to the 21,700 mark. Little bit of, uh, you know, a red tick on the Bank Nifty as well. Down about 133 odd points. Now let's start with the gainers as we usually do. Tata Motors is your top gainer, up about 1%. Coal India, up about 1%. Post strong numbers. Power Grid, Tata Consumer Products, um, Nestle, Bharti, Etel, Power, uh, Sipla are a couple of other stocks that are trending in the green line. On the red line, Aisha Motors on the back of weak Royal Enfield sales, Ultratech Cement, weak data coming in there as well. And a couple of these other names like Hero Motor Corp, m, &M largely uh, December has been disappointing, especially in spaces like tractors, which indicates that the rural economy has not improved as much. m, &M tractor sales were very weak and that stock is under a bit of pressure. In fact, HUL, Grassim, ONGC, Asian Paints and a couple of other stocks that are just languishing in the red right now. But nothing alarming. Uh, you know, it's a very, very flat start to trade. The Nifty just hanging on uh, to that 21,700. Well, that's right, uh, Sonia. A few stocks, though, that are moving around from the broader markets. You have a smaller company, Kernax Micro. Their JV has got an order worth around 110 crores from South C Central Railway. So that stock was higher with a gain of close to around 5%. Gensol Engineering, they're looking to raise close to around 300 crores via the preferential issue, the QIP route. 
So that stock as well uh, is in focus. And one of the big movers actually from the broader markets is JTL Industries. On a smaller base, those volume numbers look quite good for the past quarter. The stock is up close to around 3.5%. The promoter had said that they're putting in money at around 270 rupees. Now, all eyes are on the QIP because you want to see institutional participation. That one's up close to around 3.5%. And it's larger peer that it enjoys far better valuations. That's APL Apollo Tubes. That's been a rank outperformer of the last few years. It seems the base effect caught up a little bit in the past uh, quarter. And that's why, in fact, you know, the volumes were more or less flattish on a year-on-year -year basis and down on a sequential basis. That's why that stock is down close to around a percent and a half or thereabouts. Few more stocks that should come on your radar. South India Bank, the quarter three business updates was weaker uh, than industry growth. The deposits up only around 2%. But that one for starters, in fact, is up close to around 2% or thereabouts. And Godrish Properties, they have acquired the four-acre land parcel in Bengaluru. Revenue potential, they're saying, it's around 1,000 crores or so. That's another uh, stock that should be in focus. Sirbi? Okay, just got a couple more. Uh, by the way, there's a uh, all cargo logistics. There's a bonus, a three to one bonus. So watch out for the corporate uh, action to play out over there. Uh, some more names. Alembic is having a good start, five percent up. Arvind Smart Space is up, is up five percent. Dhanalakshmi Bank is reacting very well to its update. Advances are up almost twelve percent year on year. A quarterly update came in. So Dhanalakshmi Bank is having a good one. Uh, Kernix, of course, uh, Nigel's already mentioned. Let's pull up uh, Zomato, the stock that uh, we just had Mangalam tell us more about. I mean, that quite phenomenal. It's uh, it's intrinsically phenomenal. If you get to dynamic pricing on the platform, fee in the market's taking note of that. Stocks had a great year, and it's adding more weight, two and a half percent up there about uh, on on that one as well. So those are some of uh, the key movers. Apart from that, Lemon Tree is having a very good morning, five percent up on Lemon Tree, building on more gains. So you do have some buzz around in the mid-cap market, but otherwise the large-cap space is more or less quiet. Tata Consumer is having a good session building on. Actually, even yesterday, there was a lot of rotation playing out, some movement back into consumer and FMCG stocks, and there's evidence of that this morning as well. Look at Nestle. It's having a good follow-on day-to-day as well, and uh, Tata Consumer, which is up about a percent, percent and a half. In fact, a lot of Tata Group stocks, right? You're talking about Tata Consumer. Tata Motors is, by the way, at a fresh high this morning. Mm. And we've been talking about how that stock has really been building on to its gains for several reasons, right? Strong numbers coming through, debt reduction, free cash flow positive. Uh, and, of course, uh, the GLR sales as well have been quite strong. So this is at a fresh high, almost at 800 rupees. So a lot of Tata Group stocks uh, looking good this morning. But let's get uh, straight to our market master for the day, Sanjeev Prasad, uh, who is uh, from Kotak Securities, of course. He's been with speaking to CNBC TV 18 for so many years, now joins in. Sanjeev, hi, good morning. And uh, first, at the onset, let me wish you a very happy new year. Hope you have a great one this time around. Um, it's been very good for the market so far. But are you starting to feel that perhaps the market will now enter some sort of consolidation? Because we have big events upon us, not just the, uh, you know, the earnings, uh, session that's going to kick in now, but you also have the budget, then elections, etc. So how do you approach it? Honestly, at this point in time, it looks like there's a big fight going on between fundamentals on the one hand and uh, sentiment, which is pretty positive on the other hand. If you focus on fundamentals, uh, the market looks really, you know, uh, richly valued. Many stocks and sectors are trading at, you know, far above our Valuations, you know, so really not much of upside for many of the sectors and stocks. Uh, when you focus on sentiment and incremental news, you know, but that continues to be positive. I don't see anything negative out there which can result in a sudden correction in the market or anything like that. You know, uh, if you look at the macroeconomic fundamentals of India, that needs to be pretty good among the best as far as the world is concerned. Uh, earnings growth this year, we are looking at 18%. Uh, that is the FI24. Next year, for the 15 days, we're about 11 to percent so not too bad. Uh, and if you look at the global uh, setup, uh, interest rates will probably start uh, declining from March. Actually, that's what the market expectation for U.S. Uh, federal fund rate. So all said and done, you know, the market setup is reasonably positive. The problem is valuations are, you know, uh, fairly rich and discounting a lot of this positive and possibly more. So yeah, so as I said, it's a, it's a tussle between value on the one side, which is pretty not in the market, and uh, sentiment, which is very very positive. Right. Uh, hi, Sanjeev. Good morning and good to see you in as always. You know, Sanjeev, for the past year, it belonged to the broader markets. Mid and small caps did much better than the large cap names. Do you think 2024 is the year? With At current valuations, you could see the large caps actually outperform and 2024 will actually belong to the large caps? 
Well, we have been saying it for the last uh, three months or so that you know the mid cap thing is probably overdone, and, and uh, it looks like you know some of, there's a lot of fraud in, in many of the mid cap. Maybe one of the stocks you mentioned, I heard one of your people commenting on PHA, and if you do any sort of reverse valuation, obviously there's no way you can justify the entire market cap of the company. So there are many such stocks you know, in the mid cap space which have run up well beyond the fundamentals. Incremental news is positive, but the problem in the market seems to be that with every incremental positive news, the people are, you know, adding more market cap without realizing, you know, a lot of good news already priced in. You, know, you can't give the same news, you know, uh, you know, uh, you can't just call it five times, right? You know, so that's the problem as far as mid caps and small caps are concerned. There's a lot of thought in many of the mid cap and small cap niche, particularly in the investment sector. Anything to do with capital, you know, uh, investment that is capital good, defense, EMS, electricity. Uh, renewables, railways, a lot of wrath over there, to be honest with you. So my sense is, uh, if you are more focused on fundamentals, uh, from a reward this balance, uh, large cap look much better. Actually, last one month, at least you have seen, you know, the large caps also starting to uh, perform. And that is what our, our call was also about one large. That, you know, large caps should now probably start coming back. And thankfully, we have seen some rally in some of the uh, large cap names. I mean, honestly, there's not much value across market cap uh, our sectors now, we can still find some value in some of the large cap names, particularly in the, in the banking space. But other than that, it's a general struggle to find any value in the market. If I look at the uh, fair value which our analysts have, you know, versus the current market price, in most cases we have maybe, you know, just about 4 5% upside uh, or a lot of downside. And when we're talking about one year forward, you know, uh, 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 fair values, you know. Uh, yeah, so the struggle is there's absolutely no value in, in most part of the market now. Uh, hi, Sanjeev. Good morning. We hear you. We hear you. I think that's going to be the pain point for uh, pure fundamental stock picker, right? Because, uh, you know, you've got a market at 19 times and individual stocks much, much higher. Uh, so completely hear your valuation argument. Uh, having said that, let's talk about, as you said, sentiment is still buoyant. So we have to run with what we have here. So let's talk about perhaps what could be the big trades of 2024 as you see things right now. And around us, as we hear the chatter and the narratives, you know, I, I hear sort of two talk points. One is the banks, as you said. Uh, do you believe that large banks will be the big trade of 24? And the second question is on this continued rush in, uh, in industrials and in PSU stocks. That was a trade of 2023. Do you see that continuing into this new year? I think actually you have to look at, you know, uh, from a fundamental standpoint, John, when we, you, you see uh, this the water, what is balance being? Favorable and in your favor with some marginal safety, obviously, built in. So as I was saying, the only space where I can still see some value is some of the large caps and uh, banks, which you look at their valuations, let's say, on a quick month forward price to book basis versus where they were trading before. The pandemic, in most cases, valuation is actually lower when the fundamentals have become uh, stronger. I mean, there are some concerns about, you know, limbs coming down and credit costs at the bottom and all that stuff. But, you know, those are very well known uh, facts, and most analysts have already built those assumptions into the models. And despite that, most of the banks are doing between 13 to 16% ROE. So presumably the books will compound at a similar number. So even if the multiples don't work from where we are, as we know the rating in the multiples, then we can still make enough you know, uh, mid-teens returns as far as the banking space is concerned, which is not too bad, you know, in, in the context of the fact that most of the sectors, I can only say downside to be honest with you, assuming fundamentals reassert themselves, you know, uh, Honestly, nobody can forecast prices, so it's a total exercise. But all I can say is if I look at the price value proposition at this point in time, there is absolutely no value in most of the parts of the market, and especially the sector you mentioned, uh, industrial PSUs. Uh, obviously, that's a very, very wide space, but uh, most of the industrial names have run up a lot. Uh, no real value over there. The you know, problem seems to be a lot of good news is already discounted, and every incremental news the market wants to increase the market cap. It's a bit strange, right? You know, <laughs> I mean, there's a big disconnect between incremental positive news and uh, I mean, the first to admit that, you know, news flow is going to be positive. But a lot of that is already priced in. I mean, look at a Cochin uh, shipyard as an example. You know, how many new, you know, uh, aircraft carriers is, is Cochin going to, uh, Cochin shipyard is going to deliver, which have not been already priced in. I think two or three have already been priced in, looks like if looking at the market cap of the company. Similarly, look at uh, BHDL. So that is our problem over here. A lot of good news priced in. If you look at the uh, rate of stock run up, you know, between 100 to 150 percent in the last uh, uh, six months or so. Uh, so where is the scope of any positive surprise left over there? So yeah, so yeah. that's the challenge, you know, when it comes to mid-cap and small cap space, you know, the valuation is just extremely uh, high. 
lot of positive news is already discounted in, and I and I hope the news flow continues. Otherwise, we have a real problem on our hands. Actually, that's interesting you say that. You know, I was doing a show uh, a couple of weeks ago with Sandeep, Sandeep Tandon of Quant MF and he said that the only two sectors that are still not in very attractive zone uh, from a retail investor standpoint are metals and pharma. So, these are perhaps, you know, names where you can still find some valuation headroom. Would you agree with that assessment? Uh, Metals, I don't have a very firm view. It all depends on what's going to happen, happen to global Company prices and looking at the construct of the world doesn't look like we're going to be seeing fairly strong uh, global GDP growth. You know, uh, and keep in mind the fact that China ultimately is 50 percent of all major volumes. You know, uh, give or take, uh, and if China is slowing down given the challenges on the housing space over there, I'm not too sure whether you can have a real robust uh, commodity cycle. And same is true for uh, other big geographies, I mean, economic geographies, I should say, which are US and, and Eurozone. You know, for Europe. Uh, it's continues to struggle and uh, and US is also slowing down. Uh, so all of a sudden then I'm not too sure what's the big trigger for uh, a big bull run in commodity prices given a general slowdown in uh, in, in uh, global demand uh, condition and supply demand dynamics. I don't think look that favorable as far as most uh, measures are, are concerned. Uh, pharma is a different proposition. You have to look at every pharma stock on a more bottom up basis. I don't think there is enough uh, thumb rule that you can use over there. As of now, I also am not seeing that much value in the pharma space also, keep in mind the fact the stocks have gone up, you know, over there. Also, they are trading at, you know, uh, probably 25 to 30 times. Uh, some of the domestic pharma is even higher, actually, on a, on a money forward basis. So not much juice left over there, but uh, if you are trying to find places to hide, assuming there is a market correction, uh, I, I don't see any trigger for that. Uh, hopefully not, but uh, yeah. Uh, it doesn't look like a lot of farmers, a lot of farmers in farmer also. It's pretty time. Mm. Sanjeev, I'm reading a note coming in from Kotak today on Gale. You know, I've gone ahead and downgraded it. It appears that that one has uh, running ahead of itself on optimism. Uh, you know, a couple of these names, uh, it, it appears that you're fairly cautious on them at current prices. You tell me what is the thesis over there? Yeah, you know, people keep on coming with all sorts of theses on the PSU names. You know, uh, on Gale, when uh, three months back, everybody was concerned about, or, or rather very excited about, you know, high uh, crude prices leading to much higher profitability as far as the petroleum is concerned, uh, LPG business is concerned. Now that crude prices have come down, the thesis have moved, you know, to to higher gas, gas transmission volumes. I mean, why would suddenly gas transmission volumes go up in the country? I have no idea. But that is the whole problem, you know, the thesis just keeps on moving from, you know, from one thing to another thing, you know, and people keep on finding, you know, uh, finding uh, value in, in, in some of the PSU names. I mean, NTPC is one more classic example, you know, at half the market cap, a lot of excitement around uh, on, on the on the renewable portfolio. Nothing has happened out there. Now the thesis has moved, you know, to uh, the creation of, you know, coal-based portfolio. So people just, you know, build narratives now and, you know, market cap goes up, goes up based on narratives. Try and do any reverse validation of many of the names. You will struggle to justify even half the market cap of many of these companies uh, on a fundamental bottom-up basis. No, seriously, <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I can challenge anybody in this market who wants to have a debate on me or some of these stocks, uh, whether you can justify <laughs> the current market cap on a first principle basis. Uh. It's going to be a lot of fun, I'm telling you. Try and do things on a bottom-up basis, you will realize what, what is going on in the market. Absolutely, Sanjeev. So, the problem is we have to find, uh, you know, a pure bottom-up, uh, uh, you know, analyst to come and counter you because the market is moving on sentiment and flows and we're talking now 66,000 crores of FPI money in December and God knows, you know, how much uh, later this year. <laughs> Sorry, job, job, job of most people in the market seems to be just changing stock prices. Huh? That seems to be <laughs> okay. the job of analysts so, and investors. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, as, as we wind down the discussion, let me ask you about another issue that I'm sure we'll keep bringing up with you as the, as the year rolls on. Uh, one big market event is going to be a high-profile IPO in the form of Ola Electric, right? The first pure play EV company coming in. And every time I look can't at it, I... Sorry? Can't comment, can't comment on such things. Okay, no, okay. Uh, or not specifically on Ola Electric, my question was more broad-based. That, you know, it, it reminds me of the time when a lot of the new age companies came into the market. Initially, you know, the euphoria was built up, then the stock prices crashed, then we went through a learning curve. And now, I mean, for in, uh, instance, for in, this, uh, in the case of Zomato, uh, companies have decided the path to profitability is important. Business models are evolving. Mangalam was just telling us that, you know, look at platform fees now a reality. 
So how do you see this playing out? New age, I mean, if, if you have a, a view there and in general, some of the newer businesses that will come and list on the street this year. Obvious question. I don't know what to answer, to be honest with you. It all depends on you what valuations they come in <laughs> and so on and so forth. It's very hard, you know, to make a generic comment on something which will, you know, uh, happen in the future, right? Honestly, no, no, no views on the things which I really can't comment on. Okay, all right, fair enough. Uh, we hope to have more conversations with you and we'll keep the valuation debate okay. alive. That's a promise. <laughs> and I wish you a very, very happy 2024 to you and you. Uh, your team and of course, uh, uh, personally and professionally. All right, that's a view on the market. Markets which is taking things a little quiet uh, this uh, Tuesday morning. But let's move on and talk about a sector that's in focus and really a company that's been, uh, you know, really the talk of town. The telecom space is what we're talking about. Stocks like Bharti, Airtel and Vodafone Idea have witnessed a good surge in 2023. Vodafone Idea particularly has seen a stellar move in just the last two, three trading sessions. It's about a 30% gain that we're talking about in just two sessions alone. To discuss what lies ahead for the telecom sector, for telcos, the outlook ahead, uh, we have with us a telecom industry veteran and, of course, uh, subject matter expert Sanjay Kapoor, who was also the former Airtel CEO, as well as Balaji Subramaniam, Vice President of IIFL Securities. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining in. Good morning, season's greetings, and let me start by wishing both of you a very, very happy new year. Sanjay. First question to you, and I'm just going to you know, dive straight into it and get the elephant out of the room. We spent the better part of 2023 wondering what's happening to Vodafone idea, whether we are now a two-pronged market, can there be a third player or not? And every now and then, you know, buzz keeps coming in. Uh, without, you know, bordering on the realm of speculation, let's, let's get your view in on this. Is there a real chance of survival and Vodafone idea finding more, uh, more equity, perhaps more investors? In 2024, are we looking at a complete duopoly market or will we have, uh, you know, a thriving third player? All right. First of all, uh, a very happy new year to you and all the viewers. Um, uh, I'll try to answer your question to the best of my ability. Um, you know, let me start with a global perspective. Uh, first of all, the third and the fourth are play uh, players globally are finding it tough to make a business case given the shortening capital cycles world over because the technology that used to last 10 years now lasts only four or five years. So that's a global problem. And India is not delineated from that. Let's come down to the Indian players. There's a set of things that uh, Bharti Airtel and uh, Jio have to face in the coming years. And there's a set of things that the third and the fourth operator in India have to face during 24 and 25 and years ahead if they survive. Now, the moot question here is, uh, what happens to Voda Idea given the huge amount of debt that they carry? You know, from a share business perspective, I actually don't see a business case where uh, somebody from any part of the world will come and say, well, I'm willing to fund this company and bear all the debt burden that this company has uh, and catch up with the market players and compete with them and make a business virtue out of this going forward. I actually don't see that happening, right? It's going to be really a very, very, very tough order. Uh, you know, um, there are speculations, there will be speculations, but if Vodafone can get over that hurdle in 24 and find really somebody who who can digest that much of debt and, and make a business case out of it, then my best wishes to them. But uh, being somebody who's been in the business for a very long time, I see a very, very remote chance of that happening. Okay, I'm glad you put that down, right? For all the people who are feeling this FOMO factor of Vodafone, I mean, it's been a 30% rise in two days. So it's got to get uh, everyone's eyeballs. But uh, I'm glad you put down the facts. Balaji Subramanian, who also tracks this entire space, joins in now. Balaji, first explain to us what is the rationale behind this big move uh, that we've seen in the last two days and what's your own prognosis? Happy New Year all and uh, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, so, uh, as you would have seen, there are uh, uh, media articles which uh, talk about uh, uh, Starlink potentially uh, making an investment in uh, Vodafone idea, uh, which is seen as, you know, some sort of a ma magic bullet which can result in uh, uh, the company's uh, problems going away. But on this, I would also concur with uh, uh, Sanjay who uh, just uh, mentioned how uh, difficult it would be for anyone to uh, assume Vodafone Ideas uh, liabilities. Uh, 
so my sense is that uh, uh, one can't rule out the possibility of uh, the promoters uh, uh, putting in uh, equity at uh, some point in time now that uh, the company has got uh, government support uh, but the big uh, thing is you know who is uh, willing to cut a large check uh, a check large enough because uh, we all we all know that um, uh, there is this moratorium on uh, spectrum payments and uh, agr payments uh, till uh, late uh, 2025 but once we uh, reach uh, that point uh, the government also has got an option to convert uh, the principal during the moratorium into uh, equity which means that whoever uh, enters the stock right now uh, sees a significant uh, 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 dilution potentially uh, so that is what uh, makes things a little tricky but one uh, uh, thing which one has to keep in mind is that uh, uh, about a couple of months back or rather three months back uh, there was this development on uh, supreme court uh, allowing uh, both uh, voda idea and bharti to uh, file curative petitions against the agr plea uh, so, in case there is some relief on the uh, uh, PV of the AGR liability, uh, then uh, things can potentially uh, ease uh, uh, a fair bit for Vodafone Idea. But uh, at this point, uh, it still looks like a long shot. Okay, all right. Uh, clearly stating that out. Uh, good morning, gentlemen, both Sanjay as well as Balaji. Welcome to the show. Well, uh, Balaji, I wanted to ask you about the other point. You know, we were talking about uh, tariff hikes in 2023. No material real hike came about. But in 2024, there is hopes again. What are you penciling in? My sense is that uh, uh, till the elections get over, the probability of a tariff hike uh, remains low. But subsequent to that, I think uh, you know there are a number of things to watch out for. One is that uh, Vodafone Idea may uh, still be uh, may still have not uh, raised funds. But at least uh, they are uh, growing their absolute revenue, which was not the case maybe six to seven quarters back. Number two, uh, the extent of uh, revenue market share for gains for both uh, uh, Reliance Geo and Bharti Airtel uh, has uh, come off uh, in uh, the recent uh, uh, quarters. Because, as I said, Vodafone also has been uh, proving to be more resilient of late. And thirdly, I think at some point in time, uh, Geo uh, or you know Geo platforms will have to come out, come out with its IPO. And uh, before that, uh, probably you know they would uh, uh, like to show uh, uh, better cash flows and uh, return ratios, considering uh, they are on the uh, cusp of spending nearly twenty five billion dollars on five G in the last uh, one one and a half years. So, so all that means that a tariff hike is inevitable and maybe sometime in the second half of this calendar is when we will see that happening. Mm. Okay, let me actually uh, bring in Sanjay. Sanjay, Wayne on this. It's been a slow grind, right? We kept waiting for Bharti to cross the 200 mark on ARPU. Finally, it happened. Uh, I think it was uh, <clears throat> the first quarter, second quarter, they built on it. But the question is, will we get more meaningful tariff hikes uh, at all? Uh, you know, and if not tariffs, then what is the other big defining trend, perhaps, that uh, one should watch out for for this year from from an investor point of view? Yeah, absolutely. I think you are now moving the question from the laggards to the leaders, and uh, leaders are the ones who can uh, make a difference in the market on the tariff position. And uh, Airtel has been leading this in the past. But let me come to the moot question to say, what do you expect out of uh, Geo and what do you expect out of Airtel uh, in the coming year? Uh, to me, the biggest uh, dilemma that all of them face is, uh, uh, do we double down on 5G or do we uh, just uh, try and cover up the investments that we've made? Because 5G is not returning um, um, you know, capital to anybody and it's become uh, tough to monetize 5G. Uh, there are more, newer technologies coming in. We are talking AI. We are talking IoT, we are talking storage. Um, many of the nuances of adjacencies are now building up with the telecom operator. How do they monetize all these? And if they can't monetize, then what's the option? The option is to only uh, grow the top line and make sure there's a healthier ARPU. And like you said, there's a healthier EBITDA resultantly. Now, uh, you know, if 5G is not going to return and if the newer additions of customers given the market is reaching more saturation and there's only displacement of market share from probably Voda, Idea, BSNL to these guys, which is also slimming down now, then what is the alternative? Alternative is only to raise prices. And given what is happening to the world, 
uh, 200 rupees is absolutely insufficient. I don't want to uh, crystal ball gaze on what is the timing of, uh, but it is to me yesterday. They should be raising tariffs from yesterday. If they really have to make a virtue out of future technologies, be able to invest in customer experience uh, and double down on 5G and probably 6G tomorrow, then this tariff is not going to lead them anywhere. I think they need to take it up. And who can take the lead? It'll be either uh, Geo or it'll be Airtel. But given the past track records, I think it is Airtel more likely and Geo to follow uh, rather than the other way around. But I really hope and pray that in 24, they are able to raise up their tariffs. Uh, I leave the timing to them. All right, gentlemen, we leave it at that. Thanks a lot for joining in and, uh, you know, just assessing the situation in the telecom sector right now. There's lots that happened. And, of course, in the last two days, Vodafone Idea has been topping the charts. Let's slip into a quick break. Another stock that has topped the charts all of 2023 is Electra Green Tech. It was the big winner last year. We speak with the management, KV Pradeep, the chairman and managing director of the company, to discuss the outlook for 2024. Later, we will also have Sachidanand Uttekar of Trade Bulls to discuss markets from a technical lens in our special segment, Charting Trends. Stay tuned. Well, it's the start of a brand new year, but we're discussing the winners of last year and there have been plenty. So let's talk about them. One of the big winners of 2023 is Electra Green Tech. In fact, not just 2023, it's been a big wealth creator in the last five years. So let's talk about that. Uh, in the last 12 months, it's seen a 176, 164% return, last one year that is. But look at the last five years, 466% returns is what this company has seen. It currently is growing very well in the electric bus segment. It has a 35% market share and is striving to become the market leader. KV Pradeep, the Chairman and Managing Director at Electra Green Tech, joins us now to talk more about the business. Mr. Pradeep, uh, always great speaking to you. Happy New Year to you and your entire team. Uh, the journey has been really good so far, so I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, where are we at in terms of the overall order book currently? And what is the medium-term growth plan that Electra Green Tech has? If you can share some numbers with us. Yeah, uh, Happy New Year to uh, you and to the viewers. Thank you very much for giving the time. Uh, yes, as far as the numbers that are uh, with the Electra is, about 9,000 plus numbers today uh, we have. Uh, and... Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, participated in few more tenders where uh, 3,500 buses uh, we are L1, uh, which we are expecting in a month's time. So that is uh, briefly about the numbers uh, that Electra is aiming at. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Pradeep, uh, so we have got the order book uh, then out there and always good speaking to you, sir, on the show. Give us the execution trajectory. I recall the last time when you, know, when you joined us, we were flirting with a number of around 1,000, 1,200 for this year. And for FY25, I think we were talking about doubling down to around 2,500 to 3,000. Give us an updated number. We have your order book. What is execution going to look like? For FY24, year to date, how much is it? What do you end this year with? And for FY25. Yeah. Uh, Nigel, the first half of the year, we have delivered 232 numbers. And the seven, second half of the year, it would the number would definitely be double what we have delivered in the first half. So about uh, uh, the next uh, FY25, uh, as mentioned uh, earlier, we are planning for 2,500 numbers uh, to deliver. And, to, and 24, I missed that number. What, what do you end this year with? 500 numbers, sir. We are going to deliver during the year 25, FY25. No, 24, sir. 
2024, H1, first half we have delivered 232 numbers, and second half it would be double uh, that number. Okay. Uh, all right. So you're planning for 2500 bus delivery in FY25, and by the end of FY24, somewhere around 730 or so. But earlier, when we had spoken to you, right at the end of Q2, you had given a guidance of delivering 1000 buses by the end of FY24. You had brought down that guidance from 1200 earlier, and you also said that this is because of the stringent battery testing norms that your Q1 and Q2 was hit. And so now you're bringing down the guidance further. So is it fair to assume that there is some pressure that you're seeing in the system and how long do you think it would take before things improve? Well, no. uh, last time what I have mentioned to you is that the stringent battery norms what have been stipulated by Government of India, we have done the, uh, we have conducted all the tests and we have taken the certification from Government of India. During that time, we lost almost two quarters. First two quarters we lost uh, because of these stringent norms and uh, the upgraded uh, norms that are required to be obtained from the Government of India certificating uh, certifying agencies. Due to that, we lost two quarters and we picked up and the deliveries are, uh, the, the delivery shall be about, uh, as you rightly mentioned, it is about 700 to 800 this year. Okay, so we'll now deliver 800 buses this year. I think, you know, that's why there's a bit of pressure on the stock as well because you have been sort of scaling down your bus delivery targets uh, throughout the year. So there is a little bit of concern over there. Uh, can you tell us, um, you know, uh, I, I just want to understand that th there are a couple of tenders uh, currently underway as well. The Prime Minister e-seva order of 10,000 buses, that tender was going to be floated as well. What is the timeline that you're looking at over there? You earlier had mentioned that you are L1 in those tenders. So when do you think you can expect those orders to come through? Yeah. Uh, the, what I have mentioned is not about the Prime Minister's e-seva tender. The Prime Minister e-seva tender um, is yet to be, the court is yet to be submitted, which we have not done it. As far as the other tenders, what I have mentioned, it is 3,000 numbers for uh, uh, VEST where we are L1, and another uh, two tenders, uh, about 500 numbers where we are uh, L1 there also, put together about 3,500 numbers uh, 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 tenders, we are L1, and we are expecting those orders um, in a month's time. Okay, give us some basic details, Mr. Pradeep. What is your current capacity in buses and tippers? See, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are switching over to our new facility where uh, yes. the capacity would be 5,000 numbers. Uh, the initial capacity would be 5,000 numbers and the ultimate capacity is 10,000 numbers. As far as uh, uh, the new uh, facility is concerned, uh, as we mentioned earlier, the uh, new facility is uh, getting ready and we shall be starting the uh, partial uh, production uh, uh, in the month of uh, Feb, uh, um, uh, and uh, the full uh, facility shall get ready by uh, July 24. Okay, so this is you're talking about currently you're at 5,000, you're headed to around 10,000 capacity, right? By, yes, by yes. the middle of 2024. Yes, definitely. And, now, and this is the combined capacity of buses as well as tippers. Do you want to break that up for us? No, no, buses and tippers put together, it together. would be 5,000 initial, initially and 10,000 ultimately. Okay. You know, the last time you spoke to us, you also spoke about some fundraising plans, you know, and they, they were likely to get firmed up with the promoter putting in some money and maybe you're getting a, a couple of other investors as well. Where are you at? What is the quantum you're looking at? By when will we, uh, you know, look at that? And who's going to put in the money? Yeah. See, as far as the uh, money raise is concerned, um, we initially we thought of uh, raising the fund for our uh, 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 construction of our facility but subsequent to that as the numbers are growing up and as we require uh, 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 some more uh, uh, big monies so what we did is initially for the uh, construction of the plant uh, we have we are raising the debt and we are raising the debt from the commercial bank and we are completing a facility post that uh, we want to go in a for the fundraise. Okay. 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 So, what will the quantum be, sir? I, I didn't get that again. What will the quantum uh, of this fundraise? 
Yeah, yeah. Still, the uh, issue is in discussion with our board. Unless the board approves, probably it may not be uh, able to uh, uh, and it'll uh, be, communicate. It will be a third party or will it be uh, the promoters that will be putting bulk of the money? Both, 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 both third party as well as the promoters. Promoters wants to retain their 50% stake and the balance will be from the uh, uh, third party. Okay, fair enough. So, promoters want to retain their 50% stake. That's uh, important. Exactly. Uh, I want to understand also what the second half of the year will look like in terms of earnings. So, the first half you've ended revenues, uh, a growth of around 14%, a little over 520 crores. What kind of growth can you eke out in the second half and what's the full year target, both FI24 and 25? As far as uh, FI24, as I mentioned, 232 we have delivered and the number in the second half, it would be double no. what the numbers uh, we have delivered in the first half. I'm talking 25, about the revenues, sir. Yeah. On the revenue yeah, see, the re probably the revenues, the exact numbers probably I may not be able to speak. Uh, the numbers uh, for the FI25, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. it would be it would definitely be 2,500. Okay, 2,500. Yes, we got that. I want you to give us an update also on the insulator segment. I understand that there is a growth opportunity there. You have been, uh, you know, exporting to the US as well. What is the size of that business right now? How much do you think you can take it to over the next three to four years? See, as far as the insulator business is concerned, uh, uh, I would like to mention here that we are the largest polymer insulator manufacturers in the country. 60% um, uh, of the uh, market share, Electra Greentech does. And uh, uh, we are uh, doing about 200 crores uh, uh, top line. Out of that, 50% uh, we are exporting to US. Okay. All right. Uh... Uh, one more uh, point, you know, that the street was waiting by for clarity is the government is looking at converting, I think, a, a few lakh diesel buses into electric buses. What kind of a role do you have to play, sir, out there? What is the opportunity for you? See, as far as uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the market is concerned, uh, hmm. probably you might be knowing that uh, Electra Green Tech is the largest uh, electric bus manufacturing company in India. Mm. And uh, our buses have clocked uh, 20 crore kilometers on Indian mm. roads. On Indian roads. And uh, we have a strength, operational strength of eight years uh, of our uh, buses. Um, and uh, uh, since our buses have got 20 crore kilometers and every month we are adding one crore kilometers uh, electric kilometers. That's the yes. strength of what Electra Green has. Apart from that, Absolutely. as as we have very strong uh, uh, production capacity in technology, mm -hmm. we are aiming big to grab the market, uh, which is coming up in the coming years. Okay. Yeah, but but there's that plan to convert diesel buses to electric buses, right? I mean, if you want to put a number in there, what kind of an opportunity it is? Uh, is there? Have you heard something from the government? Will there be subsidy? What kind of benefit can you get? See, as far as uh, uh, the subsidy is concerned, there are two uh, uh, things. If the subsidy is given, the per kilometer price would be X. If uh, the subsidy is not given, it would definitely be X plus. Both the tenders are there in the market. And for some of the tenders, there are no, there is no subsidy. And for the, some of the tenders, there is subsidy. Both uh, things, uh, the stakeholders are participating and they are taking the orders. Okay. All right. Understood, uh, Mr. Pradeep. Thank you for giving us a lot of those details. Uh, once again, wish you a very happy 2024. And uh, perhaps uh, it will be another good one for uh, your team. Well, uh, we have had a lot of auto talk on the show today. By the way, those are show clearing numbers are not looking good. It's in sync with pretty much the whole sector. December has been a really tepid month. But for Leyland, the decline is as much as uh, uh, 10 to 12 percent, depending on which of the segments you're looking at. Stocks cooling off as well. Back to the market. The market, by the way, is showing up two trades right now. One is uh, pharma, and there's a very clear buying that's visible in a lot of the frontline names. So, should take note of that. Look at Cipla, look at uh, Divi, look at DRL. So, all of your large cap pharma names are seeing buying, best performing sector of the day. And autos is continuing to drag. The profit taking that started yesterday is continuing this morning. So it's not just Ashok Leyland. Should mention here MM, Aisha, Hero, all your names are on the downside. Bajaj Auto, all of these stocks are seeing uh, a further cooling off continue.
All right, it is time for our special segment, Charting Trends, to talk about some of the bigger technical trends that you can look out for as you look at your uh, trading bets. Sachida Nand Utekar of uh, Trade Bulls is with us to decode uh, the market from a technical perspective. Sachida Nand, thank you very much for joining in. First of all, wish you a very, very happy new year, happy 2024. I guess we are uh, starting the year uh, at a very interesting juncture because we are coming off after a very heady rally, especially the last two months. And now it seems the market is sort of, uh, you know, uh, taking a little bit of a breather. But you tell us, are you expecting more consolidation or could there be more volatility? And, uh, you know, uh, how should one be positioned given the rally that we've seen in the last few weeks? Uh, well, firstly, uh, a, a very happy new year to you and all the viewers of CNBC TV 18. Uh, clearly, I think the trend and the momentum from a market perspective has been very robust especially if you look at the last eight weeks of uh, Nifty's trending move. You know, it, we have already seen a very strong, uh, you know, consistent high top, high bottom base here. On the weekly basis, uh, it has managed to trend above its five-week exponential moving average support. Uh, currently, this particular support is placed at around 21,560. So, until unless we don't see uh, the Nifty, you know, breaking this particular support, the chances of a uh, change in trend uh, looks bleak. Uh, as of now, I think uh, if you look at the exhibit here, uh, since uh, the, uh, the the way uh, you know Nifty started uh, trending about that uh, 19,200 kind of a mark, uh, somewhere uh, close to the uh, you know uh, October uh, series, you know since then uh, you know uh, the Nifty has been uh, maintaining a very gradual uh, mm -hmm. you know uh, move. Uh, the acceleration has been very robust in the month of December itself. But if you look at the continuity, we expect that uh, this particular trend may continue towards 22,000, 22,240 uh, when we look at the major trends. Uh, from a daily perspective, yes, uh, we are seeing uh, some bit of a consolidation here for the last uh, few trading sessions. You know, we are seeing some profit booking prefer pressure. And if you look at the daily RSI, the exhibit two that I have shared, uh, clearly, you know, uh, we are seeing that the RSI has been uh, on a declining trajectory when wherein the prices have been rising higher. So this is a classic uh, case of a negative divergence, but uh, we are not expecting any major change here. Probably a pause is something uh, that was likely, and this is what has been exhibited uh, by the index even right now. So I think uh, uh, from a trading perspective, until unless uh, Nifty holds itself above that, uh, you know, 21,500 mark, any declines, uh, on the lower side uh, should be utilized to create some long positions. Uh, the major trend stop loss uh, still stays at around 21,120 on a closing basis. And uh, from a trading perspective, in case if we see a decline towards 21,500, 21,600, I think that will be again a good healthy opportunity uh, to create some aggressive long positions here when it comes okay. to market. Sachin, just repeating those levels for the benefit of our viewers because we're exactly trending to those levels now. It's a very decisive leg down. By the way, 100-point decline on the Nifty today. The market obviously broke yesterday's low in a jiffy. And now we're at 21,630. You're saying till 21,500 holes, get in and buy, right? That's right. And keeping okay. the stop loss somewhere close to around 21,120 mm -hmm. on a closing basis. I think, uh, you know, uh, the trade setup still remains positive. The height of higher bottom sequence only gets distorted in case of uh, uh, Nifty starts trending below that 21,120 mark. So the support at 21,560 remains healthy. So any declines towards that particular support uh, would be a good opportunity to create some long positions. All right. Uh, well, uh, you do like some of the pharma stocks. There's Dr. Reddy's also on your list. Just take us through that. Uh, what's the outlook there? Well, Sumi, I think uh, uh, we've been covering uh, Nifty Pharma uh, on this particular uh, segment. Uh, we covered or we highlighted Nifty Pharma breakout uh, from a rounding formation in the month of November. And since then, uh, we've already seen the Pharma index, you know, scaling about, uh, uh, by almost around 12, uh, 12 odd percent. Uh, so if you look at uh, the current structure on the monthly basis, you know, uh, this looks like a classic uh, bullish flag uh, pattern breakout. Now, a bullish flag is a continuation pattern which is exhibiting a price target somewhere close to around 17,914 uh, or 17,500. You know, these are the approximate levels that we are, uh, you know, expecting. And uh, mm -hmm. this has come after four months of consolidation. So I think the rally and the trend uh, should continue going forward in Nifty Pharma. Uh, this is one space where we have been recommending some aggressive long positions. And if you look at the uh, setup of Dr. Reddy's, you know, uh, uh, on the... Uh, daily scale uh, recently we have seen 
a kind of a double bottom formation at around 5400 levels from where we saw a lift off. Uh, its daily ADX has now started trending about 25, which is again a good sign of uh, you know strong directional momentum play, and that's why we are expecting that uh, this particular swing. Uh, could uh, you know uh, continue towards 59.86 on an immediate basis, and this is the uh, juncture wherein we have seen some uh, resistance. I think this particular resistance uh, may be surpassed uh, during this particular move, and we are anticipating that uh, this momentum could continue right up to around 63.70, and that's why we are recommending you know aggressive long positions even at this juncture in the price. Got it. Okay. All right, Sachi. Always good to hear your thoughts. Thanks so much for joining in. We'll track that one. Dr. Reddy is the last one that you spoke about. By the way, just keep an eye on the Nifty. We have moved lower. We're 100 points lower. Earlier today, I pointed out this level of around 21,630. The low of the day is around out there. The Nifty Bank, that's the one that's down closer on 300 points. I think we should get the intraday chart out there. That, stock, that uh, index itself has seen a sharp downtick. But a couple of stocks are doing well, namely Lemon Tree. Motilal Oswal has written a note on that one. Manglam joins us to fill us in with details on that one. Manglam. Well, on Lemon Tree Hotels, Motilal Oswal believes that, you know, this could very well be their top pick for 2024 as the company is scaling new heights. We've been talking about, you know, the entire travel and tourism theme, etc. For Lemon Tree, Motilal Oswal has a buy call with a target price of 150 odd rupees. Why is it likely to benefit? One is there is changing, there are changing dynamics in their key markets where you know, there is rising demand and there is slower supply. That means that the company can go ahead and charge higher prices, see higher occupancies. And in a business like hotels where, you know, costs are fixed, higher occupancies and higher prices would directly reflect in their operational performance as well. What is the other thing that will aid their operational performance? They are expanding via the management fees route. And by 2026 itself, or rather FI26, the management fees alone could be close to around 94 odd crore rupees and most of the management fee remember goes all the way down to the bottom line itself so all these factors favor lemon tree hotels and as a result of which motilal oswal believes that this is the right stock to play the travel and tourism theme for 2024 okay all right that's the right stock out there but the one that's the biggest loser on the nifty today is Altitec cement and after a while they've disappointed in their operational update now in the grace sales volumes which is bulk of their <coughs> volume mix well, the growth out there was only around 5%. Came in at around 25.44 million tons odd. The overseas business, well, out there on a low base, it did better because that growth was close to around 20%. Consolidated, that's the domestic operations, the white sales, gray sales, as well as the overseas operations. Put it together, the growth was only around 6%. Most of the street was expecting a number closer to the high single digits. So that was a little bit disappointing. And a couple of them had mentioned around 28 million tons odd. What could be the possible reasons that uh, the sales volumes are lower than expected? A few factors could have played out. One is labor availability issues are, are always a uh, problem during Diwali. So festive season, that's uh, number one. Number two is we have pollution-related issues in North India. Delhi, NCR, there could be some kind of a lid in terms of uh, you know, uh, 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 production-related issues. Next up, you have elections in select states. So maybe ordering was a, a little muted for around 45 days or for the past quarter. And unseasonal rains in South India, that could have hurt as well. You could also throw in there severe winters in parts of North India, which could have hurt. So put all of this together. The operational update that has come through is a little bit disappointing. Explains why the stock is down close to around 2.5%. Well, we just spoke to Sanjeev Prasad and he told us uh, Kotak's view on Gale. Sonal joins us to detail that brokerage report. Sonal. Uh, well, they have turned cautious on Gale. They say the run that we've seen in Gale stock price recently is more to do with optimism than fundamentals. And that's why they have downgraded the stock to a sell from a reduce. They say, yes, the recent run has been strong a few months ago when oil prices were higher. So it was seen up as a proxy to higher oil prices. And that's why the stock was surging. However, when oil prices came down, the stock did not fall. So basically, right now, the rise in prices that we are seeing is just purely on uh, uh, hopes uh, according to uh, according to Kotak Institutional Equities. They say the stock has even been stronger than what it was, uh, absolutely opposite to fundamentals. They say, as we noted last month, we believe that despite the recent strong gas consumption data, India's medium-term gas demand outlook is weak and long-term outlook is even weaker, so they are not very bullish on that. The outlook remains very weak for its pet chem and LPG, LPG business as well, and higher transmission pipelines does not mean higher uh, volume for the company. In fact, return on capital employed will come down and that's the reason they have downgraded the stock to a sell from a reduce with a target price of 125 rupees a share. Alright, thanks a lot for that. So that is on Gale, down almost 2.5%. Let's do one thing.
Let's take a quick break. On the other side, Manisha will join in with some commodity action coming up in just a bit. Welcome back. So on the equity side, <clears throat> we are seeing a little bit of a bounce back. So this whole buy on dip thesis, it seems to be playing out because the market's held on to the lows and it's trying to find some stability around this 21,660, 670 <clears throat> zone. You can see the little reversal. So the buyers have come in. That's equities. Let's figure out what's happening in the world of commodities. We have uh, Manisha with us in the studio now. Manisha, what's top of mind for you right now? Well, it is the crude oil prices because we have started 2024 on a definitive positive start there. A percentage of gain is already what we have put on charts in the markets there. Remember, last year was a 10% decline and that came in after two years of constant gain. So after 2020 is what we saw a decline come in for 2023. The other thing worth noticing on this chart is that the last couple of years have seen narrower ranges come in for the crude oil prices. Uh, you know, 20 to 55% of movement in the previous years is what we haven't seen in crude prices now. But for this year, this promises to be a volatile year to begin with because we are looking at various uncertainties in the year going forward. There already is concerns of what we are seeing in Red Sea and that exactly is what is adding premium to the prices. So as I said, a definite positive start coming in for the crude oil prices as we see in the start of 2024. There are US forces which are now uh, striking back at the Houthi groups in uh, Red Sea. There also are reports of Tehran sending warship in the Red Sea. So this is a thing that doesn't seem to be getting de-escalated anytime soon. If you look at uh, the overall number 
numbers here, we do understand that almost 7 million barrels per day of oil and products falls or flows through Babel Mandab's trade and uh, there are concerns coming in from that one. We also know that 12% of the global trade happens via Red Sea and that also seems to be getting impacted right now. What is adding in premium in prices also is the fact that the minute you do not take these routes but you go via the Cape of Good Hope, that is what most of the ships are doing right now, it adds $1 per barrel for crude and almost $4 a barrel for the crude products there. And that's exactly what is coming into calculation here. For the Indian markets as well, well, there are some concerns right now. But overall, the fact is that there's not so much of Russian imports coming in right now. It's the lowest since Jan 2023 in sense of numbers that we have seen for November and December. Just to give you a sense of number, we saw an all-time high import coming in from Russia at 2.15 million barrels per day. But for the month of November and December, it has been just about 1.5. So it has seen a very sharp decline coming in. If you look at the overall numbers coming in, in sense of imports from Russia, that still is on the higher side in this year as compared to previous years. That stands at a tall 1.7 zero two million barrels per day 740,000 is what we saw in the previous year and a much lower at 179,000 barrels per day in the year before that as well what the markets though are watching for right now is the u.s non-farm payroll data well that comes in on friday and that would give you further direction in sense of macros all right thanks a lot uh manisha for that let's slip into a quick break on the other side our special segment is the economy lata will get chatting with anuj puri of anarok property consultants gulam zia of knight frank india and Dipan Mehta of Elixir Equities to discuss the real estate outlook for 2024.